Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. First item uh, will be to acknowledge that we are on KFN territory and the adoption of the agenda. Moved. All in favor. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a brief uh, special council uh, or agenda here. It's the uh, financial plan. So uh, item 1A is that the Comox financial plan bylaw number 1978-2021 be adopted. Move adoption. Second. 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 Okay, any questions on that? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay, carried, thank you. And uh, for B, that the Comox tax rates and bylaw number 1979-2021 be adopted. Move adoption. Second. All, any questions? All in favor? Okay, carried, thanks. And C, that the Comox sanitary sewer and water services pilot, uh, parcel tax bylaw num number 1980 be adopted. Second. Second. Questions? All in favor? Okay, that's carried. Thanks. And a motion to adjourn. Oops. Moved. Second. All in favor? Okay, and let me just back out of this and get into my regular strategic planning. All right, so we'll call this meeting to order. First item will be the adoption of the agenda. Moved. Second. All in favor? Okay, thanks. So this is our strategic planning committee meeting and uh, we have um, three different uh, delegations. First of all, I have uh, James Warren and Devin Duville from the CBRD to talk about the financial plan overview. So uh, James and Devin, I'll let you take that over. Oh, Kevin, I'm sorry. I have it out down as Devin. Yeah, that's all right. All right. You can call them anything, just don't call them late for dinner. So. Absolutely. All right. Sorry about that, Kevin. So uh, James and uh, Kevin, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Arnott, and good afternoon to, to yourself and councillors and staff. <clears throat> and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I'm just going to share my screen. So uh, if you can just confirm for me that you can see the, uh, yes, we the first slide there. <clears throat> Yep. So yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to present today. Kevin Duville, who is our, who is the CVRD's manager of financial planning, is with me today, and we have a few slides to introduce the budget. We're grateful to present as the town of Comox is a key partner with the CVRD and the other municipalities on various projects. And in many cases, the CVRD is helping to deliver local services directly to your residents and businesses. And we, we need to work together. As illustrated, we have four distinct purposes as a regional district. And if there are two things I can leave with you, it's that provincial legislation allows for a wide variety of models for cross boundary service delivery and also that every regional district across the province is unique. The service arrangements that are at each RD, they're built by the municipal participants and the electoral area directors working together. By collaborating on service creation and service delivery, more value can be realized by your taxpayers. The CVRD's strategic and financial plans are guided by four key drivers, and they are fiscal responsibility, community and social well-being climate crisis and environmental stewardship and protection and indigenous relations. And the board set these drivers uh, a couple years ago and has been following, following them in, in service delivery. These drivers then influence and are reflected in delivering the CVRD services. The big services that most impact Comox include supplying water, conveying and treating sewage and managing solid waste. Each of these services has tremendous regulatory oversight by the province of BC, have high capital project requirements and challenging operations, but they are essential to the citizens of the Comox Valley. In 2020, the CVRD undertook both an extensive and unprecedented service and budget review in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This led to the creation and rollout of the Rethink Comox Valley Initiative and its action plans in the summer of 2020. <laughs> These plans very much influenced and impacted our 21 to 25 financial planning, which commenced last September with significant change and cost reductions while maintaining core services. Kevin, I'll turn the uh, next few slides over to you. 
Thank you very much, James, and good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and staff. Uh, so the next few slides just speak to the financial plan itself. Uh, what I wanted to provide you first is just a bit of a screenshot as to kind of how our financial planning process does uh, get undertaken annually. As much as it does feel like it, it is more of a year-round process these days, it really does formally kick off here internally in September. And that continues well into January through the budget preparation phase of this process. Uh, we then undertake a pretty extensive presentation out to our various uh, committees, commissions, and to the board itself um, uh, by way of public presentations. And certainly this year, uh, you know, with Rethink Comax Valley, you know, as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and in the past with our board strategic drivers, those became really critical core focus areas when we built our budgets over the course of this past year. Uh, with the uh, impacts of COVID-19, we also did undertake this year a, 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 an enhanced outreach and community engagement process as part of the financial planning uh, to really make sure we provided Apple opportunities for the public to provide feedback or ask questions with respect to, to the budget and specifically to budgets with those services that impact them uh, most directly and the most. Um, of course, you know, the formal authority and the approval, you know, for our service operational budgets and capital expenditures over the next five years is our annual financial plan bylaw. Um, and that really represents the culmination of the presentation of the 98 individual detailed service budgets for those services that we currently ma uh, manage. And that, as I mentioned, took place over a roughly seven week period between January and March of this year. That in then incorporated all of the feedback that we received and endorsements that we received from our board and various committees uh, over that time. And then that's really what then populated our financial plan bylaw, which by legislation we do have to adopt as a regional district by March 31st every year. Uh, next slide, please, James. So this will give you a bit of a sense of the highlights for the current 2021-2025 financial plan. Just to give you expense from an overall uh, standpoint or consolidated standpoint, our total regional district budget for 2021 uh, was $148.5 million. That's compared to $180.1 million in 2020. Broken down operationally versus capital is uh, that represents about $76 million on the operational side, which was down slightly again from 2020, and $72.5 million on the, the capital side. Um, that is really driven by some key projects, such as obviously our water treatment plant that will soon be uh, commissioned later on this year, and a number of other kind of key projects, both within our, our sewer service, solid waste, and, and other services. What does that mean from an overall requisition perspective? Overall, what we were able to put forward and what the board endorsed this year is an overall year-over-year -year net decrease to our overall tax requisitions. That decrease uh, was $226,708 or a 0.64% reduction from 2020. Um, that reduction also included a $1 million uh, reduction in the tax requisition for the Comox Strathcona Waste Management Service. Um, and, and was really kind of a, a key focal point to us being able to achieve that. Now, of course, how does that impact the individual rate payer? Of course, as regional districts, you know, we manage, as I mentioned, 98 very distinct services that have to stand alone on their own and support themselves. So really for, you know, each residential, uh, or sorry, uh, each, each taxpayer, that really gets determined by the number of services that they pay into within the areas in which they live. So that mix can be very different depending where within the regional district you lie, whether you live within a municipality versus an electoral area or which, whichever specific electoral area. Outside of the CBRD planning, what we were able to also do through the Comox Strathcona Regional Hospital District is also look at a reduction in their tax requisition for that entity. So for 2021, the tax requisition for our, our hospital district was down $4.4 million from 2020, from $17 million to 12.6. And that was done after, after much kind of review and analysis, you know, given that now the hospital projects are done and kind of behind us, we really wanted to make sure that we were looking at keeping the, uh, the, the hospital district sustainable, ensuring that we were continuing to, to put money into reserves for future expenditures. But at the same time, we're starting to pull back some of the requisition increases over the last decade or so that got us to this point. Uh, next slide, please, James. So what this slide will then give you is a bit of a perspective again on an overall uh, kind of perspective as to what the breakdown per jurisdiction was. 
So as you can see there, uh, and we always do tend to carve out uh, of the solid waste management because that is a fairly sizable tract. So you can see there kind of the changes, whether you were in an electoral area or, or versus a municipality and, and what the impacts were specifically with respect to solid waste. And I did speak to the, the million dollar reduction in that requisition, as well as the sewer. And sewer, that, that represents kind of a long-term plan that's been implemented since 2016 to move us towards the key sewer uh, infrastructure upgrades that James will be speaking to at, at the end of this presentation. So as I said, you know, uh, you know, this really shows the total uh, requisitions rather for each jurisdiction, uh, including our local service areas, and those can be impacted by a whole number of different things. Um, addition to new services could be one thing that impacts requisition requirements year over year. We didn't actually have any new services come online in 2022, or sorry, 2021. But in 2022, we do have a number of proposed new services on the horizon for a number of our electoral areas. The changes between the jurisdictions can also be impacted by the changes in assessment value, as I'm sure you, as you, you know. You know. So that apportionment will change year over year as the mix of apportionments between the various participating uh, uh, areas you know, can change. It can also be a combination of those factors. Or it could also be as a result of loss or changes in other forms of revenue, such as grant funding, surplus carry forwards, depleted reserves, and the like. Um, to give you a sense of, you know, from a service by service perspective, some of the key things. So of the 98 services that we do currently manage, 11 of our regional district service did have some, some significant increases this year, and James will be speaking to those on the next slide. Uh, but we did have 34 regional district services where they remained fairly flat versus 2020. And yet we had 14 other services, including solid waste, where we did have some significant decreases. So at the end of the day, you know, that resulted in that 0.64% uh, uh, reduction in our overall requisitions. Now, what does that mean for Comox specifically? In 2021, the total requisition required from, from the town of Comox was just over $5 million. That was up slightly from 2020, which was about 4.85 million. So it's up about 3.6%. Um, if you include though the uh, Comox Valley Emergency Program, which Comox participates in currently on a contractual basis, that increase does reduce slightly to about 3.48%. Uh, next slide, please, James. And then I believe you're gonna speak quickly on this and then I'm gonna wrap up with one additional slide. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I, I mentioned a few of the larger services that Comox participates in, and Kevin has, has mentioned a range of the other services. And just quickly, uh, there are 22 services that Comox participates in. Uh, some of those include the North Island 911 Answering Service, Community Justice, Exhibition Grounds, uh, the Regional Growth Strategy, uh, and others. To highlight a few of the key projects that are underway at the CVRD over the past year and, and in, in the coming year, in August 2020, the housing needs assessment findings were presented to municipalities and partners. This is foundational material that, along with the currently underway poverty assessment and reduction strategy, will help developers plan for community needs and local governments construct policy to promote positive growth. The Comas Valley Water Treatment Plant that uh, Kevin, Kevin mentioned. Despite added challenges related to COVID, the project remains on schedule with commissioning anticipated this summer. In February of 21, the Sewage Commission chose a preferred conveyance option for the, for the sewage through the communities with an anticipated cost of $73 million for assets that will have an 80 year service life. And I've got a bit more uh, on this topic on the next couple of slides. The regional organics facility continues to progress. It will be located at the Campbell River Waste Management Center. It has an overall project cost of 15 and a half million. Design is underway and to be finalized this spring we expect construction to begin this fall and it will be fully operational by fall of 22. And then finally, due to ongoing uncertainty of COVID-19 and resulting slower aquatics spring and summer season, the Recreation Commission supported keeping the Comox Valley Aquatic Center closed until this fall. And to use this time to upgrade the facility with uh, $790,000 in reserve funding, thus reducing future downtime by undertaking required maintenance now. And uh, Kevin, I think this one would be your last slide. 
It will be. Thank you. So yeah, what this slide just quickly illustrates is, as James mentioned, Co uh, Town of Comox currently participates in 22 regional district services. Most of those are facilitated by way of, of tax requisition, but there are a number of other services where it's a slightly different revenue uh, vehicle. So for example, the Comox Valley Emergency Program, as I mentioned, that is a service that the Town of Comox participates in on a contractual basis right now. So as you can see there, uh, the contractual rate uh, for CDP for 2021 is 46000 635. That's a reduction of just over 50,000 in 2020 to the town of Comox. Of course, you also participate in, in our, our water supply service. As you can see there, uh, partly driven by our, our Rethink Comox Valley and COVID response, uh, we, we uh, undertook a review of all of our rates and, and have reduced the uh, water rate in 2021 to 80 cents per cubic meter uh, from the 83 that it was in 2020. That rate will remain in place for the next two years. And then we'll be revisiting as we move out of the COVID pandemic and start looking at more of a fulsome recovery where those rates will then go subsequent to that. And then lastly, of course, there's the Comox Valley Sewerage Service. That service is based on a, a percentage of sewers flows and that is determined in the spring of every year. That has now been set. And based on that percentage of flows, uh, the, the amount required from uh, Comox is, is just a little over $2.1 million. So if a home, for example, just to give you a sense of what would be the impact on, on a typical town of Comox homeowner, if a home assessed at $500,000 in 2020 was worth that same amount in 2021, that homeowner would see an overall reduction in their tax requisition uh, from the regional district of about $26. Uh, now, of course, most homes don't stay at their, their assumed uh, assessment rates, you know, with, with increases and whatnot. But what that would then mean is for most residents in Comox, they should see a relatively flat net requirement as far as their regional district taxes go on their, on their property tax notice. And I'll turn it over to James for the final couple of slides. Thanks, Kevin. So we've mentioned a couple of times the sewer conveyance project, and it is of course to address the environmental risk that exists along the Willamar Bluffs, but it is much more. We have aging pump stations, which during heavy winter rains are at times beyond capacity, and the Comox Road portion along the estuary must be replaced. We are at this point in time, thanks to an extensive planning process and significant public engagement, along with value planning that solicited the advice of experts from across North America. The Town of Comox Sewage Commission members and staff have been instrumental in helping to lead the technical and public approaches and to now have a design bid build concept for the cut and cover sewer line replacement through the town positions us all well as we move into the next phases of this project. This is the timeline for the conveyance project and, and it was shared at a recent Sewage Commission meeting using the design bid build approach for the town of Comox section. We recognize there will be an impact to the town's residents and businesses, but the imposition will be relatively short term considering the importance of the works and the long term nature of the results. Extensive reviews will be conducted with town staff to work through specific project details along the way. At this time, we thank you for your support to date and appreciate that you will have to balance this project with other town priorities. Given all of the work on this project, staying on schedule to resolve sewer conveyance for generations to come will be critically important. So please be sure to call on us to present additional information and to support you in, in any other way. And as I understand, uh, CVRD staff will be attending your council meeting next week to provide additional details on the conveyance project. So with that, your worship, uh, Kevin and I are available to answer any questions you might have. Thank Great, you. thank you very much. Uh, uh, James and uh, Kevin, much appreciated. And uh, I know from all of us uh, at the town of Comox, we do appreciate and respect the, uh, uh, the relationship that we have with the regional district. So thank you very much. And through the council, do, uh, do you have any questions or comments for, uh, let's see, I saw Councillor uh, McKenna and then uh, Minions. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, thanks for the presentation, James and uh, Kevin. Um, question for you, <clears throat> you know, really uh, nice looking budget. Uh, what surprised you in 2020? Like what, uh, what were your actuals versus budget? What, what shocked you over or under? <laughs> 
Um, like I said, I mean, you know, COVID certainly had its impacts and we weren't quite sure, you know, kind of as we got down the road, what to expect with that. I mean, obviously the, the restart money that we received uh, provincially certainly did help offset some of that. Uh, you know, the two services we had the greatest concerns in were our rec complexes service uh, and transit. Uh, those were, we knew were going to be the most impacted uh, by the result of the shutdowns. Uh, and of course, as James alluded to, you know, kind of our, our aquatic center, you know, continues to be shut down, you know, as we as we work through those processes. Uh, you know, thankfully, you know, with some of the adjustments that we undertook, you know, we, we tried to take as balanced approach as we could um, and, and certainly looked at all of our services in the fr in, in, from the lens of how can we support, you know, certainly in the interim, the, the, the residents throughout the valley, given the challenges that they're also continuing to deal with. But at the same time, ensure that we're continuing to be able to provide you know, kind of sustainable and, 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 and uh, much needed services and, and yet not curtail things too far back that we were then going to have to wrap things up in the next year or two. So we really tried to take that balanced approach. And yet at the end of the day, our board was certainly very pleased uh, with us being able to bring forward, you know, an overall requisition uh, outlook uh, where we were able to provide some of those savings, but we were still certainly looking out towards the future. Thank you. Great, thanks, Councilor Minions. Thank you for that. And it's nice to see that reduction this year during COVID. I'm just wondering if you did take like the outliers such as the hospital board that kind of had that $4.4 million reduction. If, if that hadn't have happened is the overall trend that, you know, I'm just curious if we took that out, what the actual tax increase could have looked like in case in future years, we don't kind of have those larger outliers. It seems like the trends on services are all kind of increasing at a relatively, you know, inflatable price. So without something like hospital board, would we have seen something like a four to five percent or is that known? Well, as I said, you know, with hospital, because it's a standalone entity that was kind of, you know, kind of taken in isolation. Uh, the one that impacted, obviously, from a from a CBRD perspective, obviously, was was the uh, one million dollar rec uh, requisition decrease in, in our uh, solid waste service. That requisition decrease will be in place over the life of this current five year plan, so that will be a known quantity over the next five years. Um, you know, as I as I mentioned, we had a number of services that did remain flat, about 34, 35 services that there was very no change. In, and those are services where we don't see a lot of volatility necessarily. We did have some others where we definitely did see some increases, but a lot of that was really driven by kind of the work plans or the, the, the workflow that's being undertaken there. Uh, RGS, for example, it's certainly a service that's uh, a very different animal than it was a number of years ago. And there's a number of initiatives and, and, and very key projects that are being undertaken there. Uh, so that certainly had some, some, some impacts. Uh, and we did see some, some impacts in some of our other service areas as well, just because again, of the nature of the, the various initiatives. I see a lot of those impacts kind of stabilizing over the long term, but again, we will certainly continue to review those on an annual basis. Um, as I said, you know, if, if you take away that, that million dollars in solid waste, that probably would have resulted in some kind of modest uh, increase, but, but certainly nothing, you know, kind of in, in the size that we, we saw in peace past years. I think if I can add to that as well, the um, some of the increases we we do see tend to be around the regulatory services and increasing regulations that we we must comply with on some of our um, some of our services. All that being said, the rethink exercise, the the COVID renewal exercise that uh, that we went through in the late spring and and summertime. Um, I think some of the directors were, were saying this is this is an activity that should not be done just during a pandemic. It should be done on a more regular basis. And, uh, and I think what we learned from that is that it does provide all sorts of opportunities to look for ways to streamline our approach, to be more effective and, and to look, you know, like Kevin said, not not creating a situation where we're going to have to ramp back up in the future, but be really mindful about the, the budgets that we're putting forward and the work plans we're putting forward. Uh, and so that I think we'll see that same, maybe not to the same degree, but we'll see very similar uh, themes in our in our budgeting and work planning going forward. Okay, thanks. And I have Councillor Grant. Yeah, thanks. I'm just wondering if if we gave some of the money back that we took out of solid waste, could they pick our garbage up on time? <laughs> You no want problem. to tackle that, James? <laughs> <laughs> I, I right. assume that one was rhetorical. Note, um, <laughs> I'm assuming too. 
Any other questions or comments? Uh, Pat, uh, Councilor McKenna, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, just one more question, maybe to James. James, for the for the vast YouTube Comox Council viewership at home, um, can you explain uh, the cut and cover approach on the sewer system, and like what does cut and cover mean uh, as as the future unfolds here with sewer? Absolutely, thanks, Councillor. Um, so I will maybe I'll put a pitch in for next Wednesday. I'm assuming it's at 5 p.m. Your council meeting, uh, Russell Dyson and, and Chris LaRose will be attending and we'll be able to talk in much more detail about the uh, the sewer conveyance line project and, and working with the town of Comox. That said, cut and cover is, if you can imagine, in a road right away, uh, there are sewer lines running underneath the road. Cut and cover means that the the we would work to cut the road open, expose the, the old sewer line, replace it or repair it, and then cover that up again with, with fill, backfill, um, whatever other utilities are in, in that same trench, and then, and then repave. So cut and cover means to cut down to the existing sewer line and replace, and then fill it back up, cover it back up. Yeah, and I think in this instance, there is no sewer line. So they're just opening it up, laying it as they go, and, and then kind of block by block, kind of filling in and patching it up. Is that pretty much it? Very, yeah, very good point. The existing yeah. sewer line runs along the foreshore, yeah. uh, I believe under Marina Park into the Jane Place pump station and then further along the foreshine, foreshore to Goose Spit and then along the Willamar Bluffs. Right. The, um, the proposed new conveyance line would use road right of ways as opposed to running along the foreshore. Mm -hmm. Thank good. you. Yeah, that'll be good to get that off of Wilmar Bluffs area. Okay, any further questions for the gentlemen before we let them go home? Uh, James and Kevin, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to uh, spend with us this evening. Much appreciated. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay, so in the waiting room, we have Andrew Nardi. He's with Johnson Controls, and this is uh, regarding Community Building Retrofit Initiative. So do we have uh, Andrew? Okay. This is regarding uh, improve energy efficiency and decrease energy costs around town owned buildings. Andrew, welcome. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out who's talking to me today. Um, who just me, me here, I'm Mayor Russ Arnott. Oh, hi. Hi. To meet you, Mayor. Yeah. So Andrew, uh, we have a council, some present, some in Zoom, and uh, I'm sure a whole bunch of people in uh, the YouTube world and Comox are, are watching too. So please go ahead with your presentation. Sounds good. Um, just give me a moment. I'll flip over my slides and we should be good to go. Okay. All right. Let's see how this works. Tell me when you can see my screen. Yep, we got it there. Okay. I'm going to do it this way. Perfect. All right. Well, <laughs> this is auspicious and it's different, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak to, um, to everybody watching and also the council members and mayor yourself uh, today. Um, it's, you know, just giving me an opportunity to be in your home is very uh, unique and I appreciate you for that. And if you hear my kids up making some noises, they're also saying that they are here. So <laughs> well, we welcome them too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the agenda for today is quite straightforward. I'm going to go through a couple of things. Let, we're going to skip introduction a little bit because there are quite a few people here. I'll introduce myself and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing with, uh, with the Comox uh, municipality team. We'll talk about a path that we've drawn collaboratively with, um, with Jordan and his team. And then going forward, we will look into the, some financial analysis and talk about some next steps. And this is meant to be collaborative and it's meant to be a conversation. So if you want to stop me, just, just say something and I'll stop and I'll answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, so the first slide here says we started by listening. And I know this sounds a bit cliche, but it is really true. Um, we started this project back in September and we met with Jordan Wall, the CAO. We met with Shelly Ashfield. We met with Clive. We met with Andrew Berger and we asked them some specific questions about where they see the town going forward. And, you know, sometimes when you plan things, you, it just seems everything we were planning, uh, you know, now in retrospect, seems like we knew what was coming down the pipe, but we didn't. This is just one of those uh, projects that um, met, uh, um, gave us an opportunity to talk to the town of Comox. But really what's happening right now is that there's a lot of federal support for, pro uh, for, for this type of project. And I'm very excited that we are having this discussion today. Um, so one of the main reasons why we had a couple of meetings earlier on in September was to really understand what, where Comox was going. And a couple of things came out pretty strong. One of them was aging infrastructure. Um, you know, it, it, it seemed quite clear that there's a lot of influx of new uh, folks from different parts of Vancouver, different parts of BC, moving into your beautiful town, and it creates a lot of service pressures. Um, so uh, Jordan Wall, the CAO and team sort of highlighted these four or five areas that Comox needed to address going forward. And one of them was aging infrastructure. The next one was how to maximize um, the operational spend. Um, we, all, we, we talked about asset management and um, we also talked about how to be innovative around um, financing and around grants to be able to leverage projects like this. And then finally, and I have a little snippet here, finally, we kind of touched a little bit on, you know, Comox being uh, seen as the beacon for uh, anything climate change related. And I'm, and I'm very, very happy to, to share just before I go on that, even without this project, I feel pretty confident that you have the right team at Comox because pretty much everybody that I've spoken to seems to want to support the agenda for climate change, for reducing our carbon footprint and for doing it in a very sustainable manner without hurting the, the, you know, the, the economy, the local economy or creating some undue pressures. The Focus for us has always and will always be what you have. And you know, maybe I'll step back a little bit and introduce myself again. Um, I'm with Johnson Controls Canada and our claim to fame is whenever we come into a municipality like yours, we take a step back, we look at what you have and we find opportunities to create or leverage what you have to create opportunities and create uh, or, or create revenue opportunities and cost saving opportunities. So we, in a very short nutshell, we bring the money. So when we, when we had a chat with Jordan Wall and team, one of the major things that we talked about was, what do you have? And so we shared, they, um, the team shared that, the, you know, there, there was a new library, there was a Comox center, there was a fire hall. So these are all the assets that were within the scope for the project that we were talking about back in September. And by the way, this is not necessarily, we expect that this is going to change because what we're seeing based on our conversations is that there are other projects that are sort of on the standby, for example, water meters that I've been talking to Shelly and her team on that may also play a role here, but looking at physical building infrastructure, these are sort of what we kind of focused on. And why did we focus on this? This, this picture really is to give everybody the, it's, it's really just um, an illustration of what happens when a municipality, no different than yours, tries to do it themselves. And this picture is essentially showing that when you spend money, the, your reserve funding or grant money or whatever money that you have on these projects, you'll do a really good job, but you will always be chasing your tail. It's really hard to catch up with all the service level de uh, demands with all the uh, with all the upgrades that you need because as you fix something, something gets older. So it's really really tough for 
municipalities. I mean, I work with, with municipalities, school boards, higher ed institutions, you name it. And it's the, this story is pretty consistent with what a lot of public institutions face. And I'm very happy to say that the federal government is really extending an olive branch. When you think about some of the, the projects that we're gonna be talking about, they're extending an olive branch to say, how can, how can we support municipalities like yours and um, to, to be able to invest in, in your future, not even 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now. So, you know, in a nutshell, the model that I'm sh I, I would like to share with you is really called performance infrastructure, um, but it's based on a couple of things. So we look at your operational spend, we try and shave off anywhere between 10 to, um, 10 to 15, 20 to 30 percent. Then we take the annual spend, which is what you have. We guarantee your annual spend. We amortize that over 20 years. And we bring that money that you are going to save over 20 years to, today's, uh, to, to today to be able to do the investment that you need today. And the beauty about it, or the beauty of it, is that it's guaranteed. So when you're working on a project like this, um, the risk around how to make, you know, um, how to ensure projects are completed on time, how to ensure uh, like the fixed price around these type of projects, these are all risks that the people or companies like ours bear. So it's, it's a very, very um, municipal friendly approach for fixing infrastructure and for thinking about long-term projects. And it's this that creates the catalyst that I was I, I started sharing with you uh, today, the catalyst for municipalities to go above what their, 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 their uh, CapEx can, can support. Because as you see here on this chart, if, you, if a municipality like yours tries to do it with just the, your, your, your budgeted amount, you know, you're essentially going to be running to the red. But when you start focusing or you start injecting guaranteed energy savings into your projects, it creates another level of, of leverage that allows you to do more with the same amount of capital that you have. So, so I've already talked about that. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the, our project development um, process. This process is meant to do a couple things. If we are going to stand by the project Johnson Controls, we are very, very careful around making sure that we are de-risking the project for you. So we, you know, back in September, we met Jordan and his team. We, we started reviewing real-time energy data. And then in January, we, 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 uh, we brought um, our, our engineers on site to look at some representative buildings so that they would merge the, what we saw on the utility data and the analysis with what was on site. So right now where we are is we are almost ready to go into the investment grade audit step, which is an ASHRAE level three, if any of you folks here are, are engineers. And it's, it's the step where we actually do design, we do real, engineering design and drawings to be able to get ready for construction. And it just so happens that because of um, Shelly's, um, uh, Shelly and Jordan's um, foresight, um, our timing merges quite nicely with some of the grants that the government of Canada, the, um, the provincial government um, for BC are releasing for this type of project. So you can think about projects around the Clean BC Act. You can think about the, um, the funding that's coming through the green and inclusive uh, community buildings. You can think about the community uh, building retrofit initiative. These are all um, um, funds that were not available just last year. So our timing on this is quite nice. And, I, and I'm very, very happy around, and I, and I'm sure Jordan can probably attest to the fact that this, this is creating a very, very nice and compelling reason to be able to go forward. Now to finish up on this slide here, after the investment grade audit is done, that's when the actual implementation boots on the ground happens. And when that happens, it takes somewhere between uh, eight to 12 months. Once that wraps up, 
that's when our measurement and, and, and uh, verification kicks in. And this is a very important step because as I mentioned, a lot of the risk that municipalities don't want to bear is having to be able to measure um, greenhouse gas emission reduction numbers, being able to support um, energy savings numbers. And these are all things that we do to support your team. And the kicker around why we do it this way is if we do it right and we take our time to de-risk the project from our initial screening to the performance and measurement and verification step, we will be able to reconcile what we said we were going to do initially with what you are seeing on the ground. And the good news about it, the, the, the other good news about this, this approach is if we enter into a guaranteed performance contract, it allows us, it, 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 it puts Johnson Controls on the hook for, um, for, um, for any discrepancies in what we were expecting. So for example, if you were expecting to say to save $10 in energy savings, uh, and, or let's say 10 kilowatts, that's probably better, like 10 kilowatts of electricity, and we ended up saving only eight, that two kilowatts has to be paid to, uh, to the town of Comox. So from Comox's perspective, or from your perspective, there is no risk. Now, let's go back to what we found on your um, in your town. We looked through all the municipal buildings and we came up with this list of facility improvement measures. So we're thinking about um, an RTU replacement for the community center. We're thinking about uh, controls optimization for your, for, your, for your community center. We're looking at different strategies. Your, your street lighting, for example, will all be retrofitted. We're looking at heat pump technology for a couple of your buildings. And we're also looking at solar for your public works um, um, location as well. And all of this is, is, is focused on a singular goal of reducing your greenhouse, uh, your, your greenhouse gas emission profile. And more importantly, making sure that you are preparing yourself for the future. So we're not, none of these things that we've, none of these, um, uh, measures that we've, 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 we've outlined here are, are futuristic. These are all tried and true projects that we can bundle very nicely to be able to maximize the grants and maximize the project and the greenhouse gas emissions that we can, uh, we can reduce uh, for your municipality. This, this chart here just quite simply shows what would happen if we were to execute the project as we've shown it. We're seeing a significant reduction in your natural gas consumption and, and, and there's slight reduction in your electricity con, uh, consumption. Electricity didn't, doesn't go down significantly and it's partly because, well, BC Comox is on the BC hydro grid so it's, it's, you're starting off clean to begin with. And quite frankly, as I showed earlier on, you've, your municipality has done a really good job, um, you know, staying a little bit ahead of the curve in, 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 in making sure that you've got, um, you know, uh, things in place to not overuse your, or not go over your quote unquote budget for, electri for electricity demand. So, you know, this is pretty aggressive, but we feel that the measures that we've put into place in consultation with uh, Jordan and his team are very achievable. Now, this, this, so we went one step further, we did our analysis, and then we decided to see what would happen if we run this through our models for pricing. These are just budgetary pricing. But we think that this project shapes out around $1.3 million. Um, and, and through that, we wish we should be able to achieve all the steps that we're talking about, uh, sorry, all the measures that we've outlined here today. Um, one of the things that I'd like to mention here also is there is a first, so for today, one of the first uh, things that we, um, I'm, I'm hoping I can leave your, your municipality to ponder on is the next step, the next logical step is that uh, we're able to get into a, an engineering study 
and that's where all the grants and all the um, and all the grants that we're looking at that that's that's what they want us to do uh, in terms of preparing to be able to move to the to the implementation step. So as you can see, our FIM um, zero, which is really just a number here, is saying that we're going to do a national level three um, investment grade engineering study, and we've already costed it out at eighty seven thousand for your municipality. I mentioned that we were doing everything we can to support your municipality with the grants. And we've met with directors of um, Clean BC, BC Hydro, um, FCN, Federation of Canadian Municipality. And we've also met with the federal government as well to look at what they can do to support the town of Comox. Um, and I'm very happy to say that it's, it's quite aggressive what they're looking to do. So we've put, we've, we're thinking that if we, if, if we are very fortunate and grants are never you know, guaranteed, but if we play our cards right, uh, there's a good chance we might get about $69,000 to cover the $87,000 in the engineering study, which is the first step. And then here is really just a breakout of all the grants that we're planning to uh, be able to um, or we're, we're planning to support the town of Comox with uh, through applications. But as you can see, it's quite significant. You know, it's about $300,000 in grant money that's available for your municipality. And when you take that $300,000, it really leverages the project very well. Um, you know, let me- I take have a quick question for you. Go ahead. Since, you, you, since you said we could ask. So uh, the, the grant writing, do we do that or do you do that? Correct. So that's something that we've been working on with Jordan uh, and Shelly. Um, and and um, they've, Shelly Ashfield, I mean. And um, it's, so it's, it's the responsibility of Johnson Controls and we're putting that together. Um, but we're also, and we've, we always engage um, the town of Comox to make sure that we're not saying something that's out of turn. Okay, thank you. And, and Andrew's being a little modest here. The amount of work that they've put into um, researching this, putting the grants together, uh, he's definitely worked with our team and we've supported where we can, but it's been great to work with this company so far because they, as you mentioned, they take on the risk of this. So the time that they've spent, which is already in, um, included writing for, I mean, multiple grants, which are, are difficult to do. Uh, they've come down to the town of Comox to take a look at all of our buildings, multiple meetings with our teams. That's something that they do in order to get the information to submit for the grants. And we haven't actually paid for any of this service yet. It's been a, a fantastic process so far. And I'll let you continue, Andrew. I'll just, I'll plug you a little bit. Um, <laughs> One of the, you know, the grant opportunities are out there and one of the difficulties we have is just finding the staff resources. And when you get grant writers, a lot of time it turns out that we have to spend just as much time getting the grant writer to the understanding to write the grants. These guys have taken it from start to finish and it's been a, it's been a really wonderful process so far. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. And, you know, I would love to show up one of these days and say, here you go, you know, the everything checked out. Um, there's always the caveat with grants um, that until you get the check, it's, uh, you don't know, but we're, we're, we have enough resources, we have enough experience. And, you know, I, I really appreciate the collaboration that I've seen with, oh, it's, um, it's, 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 it's Shelly, it's Jordan, it's, it's Andrew Berger, it's Clive. Everybody seems to be very engaged. And, I, you know, it's, it's quite unusual for a municipality to be this supportive of, of, uh, of anything. So, I, you know, I, I'm quite appreciative of, of the quick turnaround around reviewing some of these uh, proposals that we're putting together for, the, for your municipality. Um, so here's a quick update. Um, here are the grants that we're looking at. The first one is FCM. Uh, we're looking at the community buildings grant and they've, they've, we sent in the first Pre, uh, the, the first application, everything checked out, they pre-approved it. We, uh, we, and, so, and then the next step was to um, send in the application, the, the actual application, which we did on May 7th. 
And I believe we got a response this morning uh, saying that it's, it's, you know, it's in the works and we will be contacted. So everything is working out nicely that way. Um, FCM, if this checks out, they will pay 80% of the project for engineering, which is significant. Um, Clean BC, it's, they've, we've finished this round and we're looking at an air source heat pump and they will fund, I think 20 or 30% of that project as well. So that's very nice. Um, BC Hydro, we reached out to them and uh, they said after the engineering, when it's time to install, provided we follow their criteria, they will reimburse at installation. So this is a rebate style uh, project. And we think, um, you know, based on how we're planning to do this, we should be okay there. And then finally, there's a new grant that came out uh, two, three weeks ago, and we're in the process of also submitting um, this as well. And this, all these grants are stackable. That's the, that's the crazy thing about these grants that are coming out. You know, usually you get one, you can't get the other, um, but they're really stackable. And it really creates a very good leverage for your municipality to even think about what else you could do, stretch, stretch beyond what we're currently looking, or just you know, reduce your, um, um, your investment into this project. Um, so the next step is kind of what we're doing right now. We're having a conversation today and it's really an update for your municipality to, to get a sense for what Johnson Controls brings to the table. Um, and um, I'm hoping after this, uh, you know, the, what's on the table is we need to really get going on the engineering. Um, we don't see a lot of risk right now with some of the grants that are available to to support so and, and and this engineering step is needed for any for any of the grants that are that that, that we're looking to uh, to apply for so it's it's definitely necessary. Once that's completed, then we do an engineering kickoff. We begin looking at bringing in local consultants. Um, we're we're going to try to encourage local. Uh, community support around these type of projects because one, it's a requirement, uh, but it, it favors us that we use um, a lot of um, um, sort of engineering support locally. Um, it, it, it shows well on the application. It shows well that we're creating local jobs, and um, and 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 quite frankly, it's a it's definitely a cheaper all. It's 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 a more inexpensive alternative. Than, than using anybody from wherever. So, so we, are, we are tapped into local resources. We love to live and work wherever we can. So I'm very, very encouraged by what I'm seeing. And I guess I can probably stop here, but I just wanted to end on a really positive note that you know, we are flowing with the tide right now. And um, you know, when I say we, I mean the town of Comox is flowing with the tide. And we're hoping that we can keep on riding that wave with grant availability, with support for greenhouse gas emission reduction, and really for infrastructure upgrades beyond, above and beyond what your municipality needs today by planning for tomorrow. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much for that. That was a great uh, presentation. Do we have any questions or comments from council? Councillor Bissinger, and then Councillor McGowan. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for uh, presenting, and thank you to staff for, I guess, being innovative and foresight um, into these energy savings. I know at the base, we have an energy performance contract with a different ESCO, and I guess my question to you, Andrew, you mentioned, you know, there's $1.3 million that the town of Comox would pay, but in result of that, there'd be energy savings each year. I think it was in the um, surroundings of $60,000 a year if I saw it correctly on your table the EPC that we have at the base basically like we pay nothing but then the ESCO gets all the savings or gets paid based on you know the 5 10 15 20 year paybacks of different projects for example replacing lights by LEDs you would get a quicker payback so the ESCO would get those savings for the next 20 years even though they actually get reimbursed I guess over five years of energy savings or so so I'm just trying to wrap my head around is that the 
the way this contract would be set up or do we disperse the 1.3 million dollars for the engineering and for the capital projects and then the town of Comox sees the savings year after year after year or is it Johnson Controls that then would also see the savings on top of that 1.3 million dollar capital injection thank you wow that's a fantastic question um <laughs> she, she's an engineer thank you for that um <laughs> Let's see whether I can, I can, so it really depends on what the town of Comox wants to do. My preference is this, that we, $60,000 is what we can find in guaranteed energy savings for the project. So my preference would be, let's take that $60,000, let's amortize that over 15 years or 20 years, that's 1.3 by itself, right? And then that could pay for the project with a little bit of a cost of capital, right? Essentially what I've explained to you in a very short form is that you can see what happens that this project 1.3 can actually be paid off with just the guaranteed energy savings, right? Um, without grants or anything, which makes grants for this project quite irrelevant, but very nice of a boost. Uh, that's our preference. We have so many different models. Another model that we're toying around right now is, is to use the, um, a contingent payment model where we say no payment is made to Johnson Controls or to anybody up until the actual project is fully installed and it starts generating energy savings. And the energy savings paid will be the sorry, the amount paid to Johnson Controls will be equal to the energy savings accrued in that year. So that's another model, right? We can talk about another model, like uh, we call it energy as a service, where um, it's based on this, on the SaaS model, where you're essentially um, looking at, uh, we essentially own that asset completely, and then you make payments as if you were renting that asset. So we've got so many different models, our, our goal with this first step of engineering is to do one thing, is to complete what's required for the grants and show up with the financial model that you want. So, or, or, the, or the financing model that fits the town of Comox. And if Comox chooses to say, you know what, we've got reserve funding and we would rather pay ourselves that $60,000 over the next 20 years, provided you don't spend it somewhere else, that's up to you. Right. So there's so many different ways that you can skin this cat. OK, so we'll we'll get those proposals, I guess, once you're done the uh, the engineering and the ASHRAE level three. I yes, guess. you bet. Okay. You bet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I think Councilor McGowan, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly don't have such a, a amazingly wonderful question. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to staff and to you, Andrew. Um, and your team for all the work that you've already put into this. This is really, it's, I find it really exciting. Like I'm, I'm not an engineer, so I don't necessarily know where all these uh, wonderful energy savings and sustainability models are, are available. And um, so I'm just, I, I think that collaboration is, is a wonderful way forward and um, probably the way that we can make the biggest impact on, uh, on our, our climate issues so i just wanted to say thank you for all of the work that's already been done it's it's been fantastic to see thank you thank you appreciate it okay thanks any further questions or comments for andrew andrew uh seeing none thank you very much appreciate your uh, presentation and i'm sure we'll be hearing more from you in the future you bet thanks so much cheers Take care. good night and we have Corey Sybil. He's with Urban Systems, and he's going to talk to us about asset management. And we're just uh, bringing him in. Uh, it was one of those, um, you know,
know, I would say on a weekly basis, I probably get 10 offers to reach out for, for companies looking to, to talk and read through the proposal. And this one was a really good one and been pretty happy so far. So, <clears throat> Uh, in regards to your question, Councillor Bissinger, is she still there? Oh, you're still there. Okay. Um, likely where we're going to head is that we would look at doing a flat rate for Johnson Controls and they would act and get their funds um, through acting as a general manager of the project. Uh, and that's just because the municipality has such strong levels of reserves. We can borrow the money from ourselves so that most of the money or as much of the benefit through this project flows back to the town. We're going to look at that. It's still something I need to talk to Clive about, and, and it's partly going to be um, based on what we have in the asset uh, funding that we're going to be talking about with Corey right now. But I, I anticipate that the way we're going to do this is that we would fund it ourselves and use them as general contractors for which they would take their fee out of that. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, welcome, Corey. Yeah, you were uh, just waiting there for you. So go ahead, sir, and have your uh, presentation. And then I'm sure there'll be some questions afterwards. Yeah, so maybe I'll quickly introduce Corey. So Corey's been working with the town for um, a little while. And actually, when I came to Comox, I was very happy to hear because I've been working with Corey up in Tumble Ridge to develop the asset management system there. And to see that uh, Corey was selected down here in Comox, I was very happy because I was familiar with the system. And and really supportive of the work that uh, he does and, and even more supportive of that Comox was about a year ahead of where I was in Tumba Ridge. So I got to skip a good solid year of this work. So um, I, I council's aware that you've been working on our asset management program and, and I'm just excited for them to see where we're headed on this. So if you want to take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much for the kind words, Jordan, and super stoked and excited to be here with you guys today. Um, so I'll bring up my presentation and I'll share my screen. Let me know if you guys can see the screen okay. Yeah, we got it. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, screen's good? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. So appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Corey uh, from your city and uh, here to talk about the asset replacement funding plan uh, for the Canada Comox. So today we'll go over a couple phases. We'll go over a quick little introduction. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the asset replacement funding plan and we'll go through a summary for you. Um, so before we jump into it, I just want to kind of give you zoom out and give some context across Canada nationally. So overall, asset management has gained a lot of traction across the country and kind of what it stemmed back to is communities in general have done a very good job at planning for operation and maintenance costs, uh, staff, you know, maintenance, ongoing stuff. But one thing that communities across Canada haven't done a super great job at is financially planning for the eventual replacement of assets. And kind of why has that happened? Well, a lot of these assets are buried under the ground. They have long lifespans, 80, 100 years sometimes. And so it never was really a worry. And essentially assets started nearing the end of their lives. And this has kind of got up to a national issue where FCM and other organizations were like, we need to bring attention and awareness to this before it gets too late. So it's really gained some national uh, initiative. It's kind of funneled down through grant funding programs that have come out. Uh, UBCM supporting uh, asset management, as you guys know, probably attending those conferences, lots of conversations, organizations like Asset Management BC, CNAM, Canadian NAS, uh, Network of Asset Managers. So a lot of momentum has gained around this super important topic and communities across Canada and the world, in fact, have begun kind of talking uh, about asset management, which is what brings us here today. What I feel super grateful for is that the town of Comox has been very proactive with this and have really taken this by the horns, which I think is super important uh, to help set your community up for success. So that's some context nationally. Now, I just wanna kind of jump, quickly jump into why I believe asset management is important and everyone has different lenses and perspectives on this, uh, but these are a couple of the core ones that I've found. So number one, why what asset management really does is ensures your communities today can meet the needs of the future in a socially environmentally and economically responsible way. So it's really just kind of planning for the future in, in the right way. Uh, number two, which I would say is less important, but totally understand it is important for communities, especially small ones, uh, is it's actually part of grant funding requirements now. So basically, 
you know, granting agencies don't want to give you assets or give you funding for big capital projects if you don't have the financial means to replace the assets you already own, plus the asset that they are kind of giving you funding for. So that's becoming a very big thing. It's also required in the LGD in the annual reporting. Um, so that's kind of one reason. Uh, the other thing is it really just helps you guys as decision makers make tr- good decisions that allows you to see the trade-offs between risk, level of service, the available resources, et cetera. So it, it becomes a tool to kind of empower you guys to make amazing decisions. And number four, which I think is a, a big one, honestly, is it helps prevent the need for kind of, you know, large one-off tax increases in the future. If you plan today and you put a little money away each year uh, for the eventual replacement of assets, in the future, you don't have to have these big spikes uh, in, in tax increases. So that's the other one. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, in terms of the local context for Comox, Comox has started in its asset management journey. You guys have done a great job. Uh, kind of the previous asset management work uh, was really focused on compiling data and projecting life cycle uh, funding targets based on industry best practice service lives. And that was a great starting point. A lot of great momentum was created. But one of the challenges with kind of using industry best practice service lives and kind of high level data is it is it results in a funding target that is quite high and sometimes not attainable. Um, And that's essentially kind of was the starting point for Comox. So it was a great first stepping stone. It's always the first step in the right direction that every community takes. Um, But I think the funding target came out to around seven million dollars a year for asset replacement. And I think the town was around three million a year spending. So there's about a four million dollar funding gap. And so that's what really kind of drove, uh, you know, Comox to look a little bit deeper saying, well, how can we begin to bridge that funding gap? How can we make that funding target a little more realistic? And how can we ground it in risk and level of service? So that's really what led us to this project. Um, So this project, really the goal was to help the town of Comox begin to bridge that funding gap, get it into an area that's a little bit more realistic and grounded in risk and level of service. So that's really uh, that was this project. The outcomes of this project, really the goals are awareness. So bring some awareness to, you know, what is going on with asset management. Number two is to develop community specific service lives. So this is the move away from kind of generic industry best practice lifespans on assets. Let's ground it in some condition information, the knowledge of operators, et cetera. And the third thing is really to understand what is risk and what is level of service and how does it tie into asset replacement. And the last thing is really gaining some confidence and clarity on your financial future. So that's really the the main outcomes and goals. Now, before we jump into it, I just kind of want to highlight some common challenges with traditional asset management planning. It's just something to be aware of and cognizant of. So number one, uh, a lot of asset management planning approaches result in unrealistic budgets. I'm sure you guys have heard this talking to colleagues. It's this crazy number and you're down here and seems like the world's falling apart. And um, so that is a challenge that we need to kind of be cognizant of. It's not always the case. And we'll get into how we can work around that. Um, Asset management plans also generally remain unfunded. So typically you present a big number, but they'll never make it into a financial strategy. So it's really expense focused, but it never gets into how are we gonna pay for this? Uh, The third thing, it's really difficult to see the trade-offs between risk, level, service, and cost. A lot of conversations happen around that, but what's a simple way for a small community to to truly understand, like, how do we move these levers? How do we, if we increase level of service or increase risk, how does that affect cost? And it becomes very expensive for small communities to do this. And uh, it's also difficult for, for, um, you know, council and staff to basically understand decisions today what do they mean for the future? You know, if we fund at this level, what does it mean 20 years, 30 years into the future? So those are some of the challenge. Um, And the cool thing is we've been able to actually overcome all those challenges through what we call the asset health score framework. And this is the journey that we're going to be taking town of Comox through. So it's a two kind of pronged approach. Uh, The first one is the funding plan, which is what we're going to talk about today. And that project is really focused on setting a funding target grounded in risk and level of service and honing in that funding target is something that's a little bit more realistic, tangible, and on the ground for Comox. Phase number two is developing the financial strategy. So once you get clear on the future risk and level of service you want in your community and the funding target, 
Now, how are we going to get there financially, which is phase two? So today's conversation is really focused on the funding plan, and we'll go through each of these steps next. So we'll talk a little bit about the data. We're going to talk a little about risk and level service. We're going to talk a little bit about funding demand. And finally, we're going to talk about forecasted budget, which will show you the impact different funding levels have on risk and level service levels in the town of Kamok. So uh, that's it. And just for some context, um, the conversation with council, the way it's going to progress is, and, you know, we're totally open to different ideas and, and suggestions around this, but really it's step number one is just getting some bearings on asset management. What does the asset health scores mean? What does risk and level service mean? Number two is a conversation around, you know, what is that desired risk and level service with council uh, for the community? And then step number three is really developing that financial strategy uh, to get there. And so the really the purpose of today's conversation is just to generate some good information, generate some good dialogue, have some conversation around some information. Um, and that's really the purpose and intent uh, today. So I guess in terms of uh, progress and flow, I just want to kind of check in, Jordan. Do you want me to kind of roll through the presentation? Do you want me to stop periodically and check in with everyone? What's kind of the... the process here that you guys would like to go through? I'm going to guess, I think it's always better for these longer presentations to stop and have conversations along the way. And, and for council, encourage you guys, if you have questions or, you know, just things you want to slow down and talk about as we go through this, um, let's do that and, and just have kind of a natural conversation as we go through. Because really, this is going to be uh, what this is, is a proposal on how we can approach asset management. It's going to be council that needs to make the adoption of using these methods. And uh, so to make sure you guys are comfortable, like I said, let's just have a, a good conversation as we go through. So maybe before we move on, um, we can pause and, and talk about what, uh, or have, answer any questions or start any conversations council may have. Councillor McKenna. Hey, Corey, thanks. Uh, I've asked a lot of people this question and and you might have um an understanding of it or not and i don't know if there's an actual right answer or not um but since i got elected one of the things i've always been enamored with is reserve funding is there a metric by municipality for what's the right amount of reserve funding like is there a standard metric per dollar budget or per capita yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Jordan, for some context. Pat, thanks for the question. And, and just to kind of jump onto Jordan's comment. Yeah, I'd love this to be an open dialogue back and forth. It's casual conversation between us. And it, this is for you to kind of dig in and, and chat about. And Pat, to your question, uh, it's a great one. It comes up lots. Is there a general rule of thumb or industry best practice? I haven't found anything. There's different methodologies and thought processes around it though. Um, and you can go down a lot of different paths. And I think that's something in the financial strategy piece that we'll get into for you guys. Um, but at a high level, I like to think about, and you'll see today, I like to think about how much of your assets are you gonna allow go past your life, past their estimated life? That's a risk tolerance level. Then what portion of that do you wanna have in a reserve in case they actually do fail? So we'll get into like what that all means. So. High level answer, no, there's no general rule of thumb. Uh, it's community specific. It's based on your risk level, uh, based on what you want, based on your future expenditures, et cetera. But I'll, I'll weave it into the conversation later because I think it'll give more context. And in particular, in kind of that financial strategy phase, that's where it'll become really uh, important to, to get clarity on. And one of the interesting things about what Corey does is he does tie it to a metric with the asset health scores. And you know, something that council may want to think about because it's going to be council that decides what asset health scores you determine are appropriate for the different types of services within the municipality. At, uh, Corey's worked with a number of municipalities and developed asset health scores for them, some of them healthy um, and some of them not. And it, uh, it may be worth when COVID is done and we're able to travel outside of our health region is taking a look at some of the communities that have lower and higher health or asset health scores and seeing what that actually means. What does it mean to have a road that's a, a road network where your asset health score is low? What does it mean to have an asset, uh, a road network where your asset health scores maintain at a higher level? And um, it'll really allow, again, council to set that service level because one thing that Corey always stresses is that 
we are setting service levels with the infrastructure um, with the infrastructure funding that we provide, and that ties into the asset health score. So the asset health score will provide Councillor McKenna that metric that you're uh, looking for. Okay, any further questions before we move on? Seeing none, go ahead, Corey. Awesome, thank you so much. And Jordan, thanks for kind of teeing that up. And I'll just tug on one thing there with the health score, which you'll see, generally speaking, communities might set a lower health score, but there's a higher risk of asset failure. In that case, you might wanna carry a higher reserve fund level in case some failures happen. Other communities set a higher asset health score and they have less reserve funds because they're more confident the assets won't fail. So it'll depend and that will make much more sense in a couple of minutes. So um, let's just jump into here. Uh, before we move on to this slide, I'm just gonna close the window because I think it's a little loud for you guys. My microphone picks up all kinds of noises. So uh, just some kind of housekeeping stuff, just some things to keep in mind here. Uh, this you know, presentation is all about like for like replacement. So this does not consider a road widening. This does not consider a water pipe needing to be bigger because it needs to serve a new development. This is like for like uh, replacement. And I think it's an important part place to start from because it's about kind of being able to replace what you have and then in the future, you can layer on growth and expansion, et cetera. And I like thinking about those in two different buckets. It's like funding for replacement, like for like, and then funding for growth or level of service increases, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing. It's also done in constant dollar analysis. Why is this? Well, there's so much uh, talk around what is inflation? What's the right level? Is inflation more now because everything that's gone on or, or is it less? So what I like to do is just Make sure you update this plan periodically, every year, every two years, whatever, you, every three years, every five years, whatever you're comfortable with. And if you do that, you'll be able to account for actual CPI adjustments in the index. And there's no conversation uh, that kind of deviates and will go down a rabbit hole. So that's, uh, I've done both and it just makes things more complicated and it doesn't add a lot of value. This is pretty high level strategic thinking. Uh, inflation is at one or two or 3% doesn't impact things significantly. Uh, for this type of study. And the assets that are being included in the study are water, sewer, transportation, land improvements or parks, buildings, drainages, fleet and equipment. So all major asset categories uh, for the town of Comox. Um, so yeah, just some kind of things to keep in mind. So uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna go through the uh, first part of the asset health score framework, uh, but we'll start with the compiling asset data. We'll breeze over this one because it's, uh, it's kind of boring, but it's important, you know, the data that goes into the plan reflects the outcome of the plan. So what we've done, um, and finance has done such a great job uh, with this, is and engineering, we've been able to compile a lot of the asset data and develop a little bit of a system and process to be able to export that data out, which informs this plan. And it can be used for two things. It can be used for financial reporting, but also the asset management plan, which is very important from an operational um, streamlining perspective. And it allows you to kind of pull from one data set. So that's done super nice. And I appreciate all the support there. Um, the other thing that we did in this specific project is we moved you guys uh, from a town away from what we call industry best practice service lives, which are often generic, uh, conservative, not community specific, um, which is part of the reason why some of those numbers, you know, funding targets get up there. And we shifted it to what I call community specific service lives. So this is the next level on the little ladder, ladder rung on confidence on service lives. And what we've done is tapped into the collective wisdom of the staff and really been able to kind of use that feedback of people on the ground, you know, does this asset actually last 50 years or is it easy or is it 75? So we've been able to kind of capture that knowledge from the public work staff, from the people working with the assets. And yes, we went line by line, line, and we looked at every single asset. So it was a pretty intense exercise, but I think it will yield some great results. And essentially you've done a condition assessment community-wide for a very, in a very efficient manner. Uh, the next level up is eventually maybe getting into like formal condition assessments and that's an ever evolving thing. Um, but I feel pretty good about where they, they are today. Is there room for improvement? hundred percent, there always is, uh, but it's much better than where it was before. So uh, that's that phase. I guess we'll just pause here on each section uh, just any questions about the data, the service lives, and uh, anything related to that. So maybe just to highlight uh, one more time. So the data that we have compiled on our assets, that's based off of um, Engineering Blue Book 
life expectancies or based on uh, real life um, projections of the people who are maintaining the assets? Yeah, good question, Jordan. So uh, they're based on the actual asset lifespans of the people maintaining uh, the assets. So they've been adjusted from kind of the blue book or industry best practice, which are generic, not community specific, to now we're using Comox specific uh, service lives. Cool. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. So, uh, funding demand. So, uh, what is funding demand? Funding demand. Uh, it may look like some capital project that's like a plan that's very fancy and laid out, but I, all it is is an estimation of when assets pass their estimated life, and that's all we're using it for. It's a trend line. And all we're looking for is three things. Is there a wave of expenditures short-term? Like, is there a big wave coming up? Is it middle-term and is it long-term? And all that gives you insight in, is it like how fast do we need to kind of ramp up uh, funding or how fast do we need to deploy capital to kind of manage that wave? Or if we decide not to deploy capital, what's the risk of that wave of expenditures or assets passing their life? So that's really what this, this purpose is. So. Um, if you roll up all your funds, you got the general fund, you got the water fund and the cap sewer capital fund. General fund, just friendly reminder, it includes assets like transportation or road assets, uh, includes parks or land improvement assets, it includes fleet and equipment, it includes buildings such as the one you're in at town hall. Um, and that's pretty much the major ones. And so that's general capital. General capital is funded through taxation, water capital is funded through water rates and sewers through sewer. So uh, this is all of them rolled up and all we're doing is looking at this trend line and seeing what's going on. So when you actually add up all the expenditures, excluding the assets already past their life and average it out over 30 years, it averages out to about $5.2 million a year in asset replacement funding. So what does that mean? If you were to replace all the assets that are coming up when they pass their theoretical life, uh, you'd have to put away or invest $5.2 million a year. Now, what's even more interesting is this trend line, how it goes up and down. So what you can see is for the first kind of 10 or 12 years, you're below the average. And then in the middle, it kind of bumps up above the average. So it tells you that there's a wave of expenditures coming kind of in the medium term. So you do have uh, some time to plan for it, but it's a good time to be thinking about it. You don't want this wave. I've seen communities where this wave is more uh, front loaded right here, and it just puts you in a less strategic uh, position. So that's overall, we'll dive into each fund and then we'll kind of ask some questions on it and roll back. So uh, this is the water capital fund. So it's the exact same graph. If you add up all the expenditures divided by 30, it works out to about 500,000 a year. Uh, again, you can see for the first 10 years, it's below the average. And then there's a little bit of a wave of expenditure here, and then it drops below um, the average. So We'll look at sewer again, almost a similar picture. You know, it's below the average for the first kind of 10 years, then a wave of expenditures coming. Um, and when we look at the general capital fund, uh, it's kind of up and down. So it's below the average for the first little while, then it bumps up, uh, but generally it's trending upwards. And so my key takeaways here is that there's some expenditures coming medium term and long term overall. Uh, number two, there is an up and down nature, which kind of emphasizes the importance of having reserves and debt to be able to manage those waves of expenditures. Um, and that, you know, today is a great position to be in to start strategically thinking about these uh, waves. So I'll pause there and see if there's any uh, questions. I see Alex uh, has her hand up. Sure. Thank you. Um, and maybe it's more a question to Jordan and for staff, or even just, you know, if we go back to the water one, like I know we had that rupture on Queens Avenue and we found the water line dated from 1947. So was that information known, for example, or I'm guessing like, what's the, and maybe I missed this earlier in your presentation. I, I apologize. I have a little kid that was freaking out. Um, but is it, you know, are we missing some data? Like what's the integrity of our data? And then, you know, if we, if, if it is accurate, I'm just surprised to see that there's not, you know, more what capital funding required for waterline replacements like right up front because I would assume that's something that's built in 1947 is way past its usable life so I'm just curious like are is there still like a big question mark as to like 50 percent of our infrastructure what's underground or do we have a good picture of what we actually have 
Yeah, great question, uh, Alex. So uh, number one, this graph actually doesn't show all the assets that are already past its life. It's just a looking forward uh, metric. So we'll actually look at the assets that are already past its life um, uh, in the next couple of slides. So it's not represented on this graph, number one. Number two, um, for some of how is the data integrity? Uh, I'd say it's, it's in okay shape. It's probably better than most communities that I've seen, but there is rooms for improvement, like for water, sewer, et cetera. It's based on the tangible capital asset reporting. Is it as detailed as having pipe segment by pipe segment drawn out in GIS with exact dates attached, et cetera, et cetera? No. Is that something you want to skate towards? 100%. Does it have to happen today? No. Um, but it's something to put on the horizon. And the better the data, the better the outcomes. But what I've kind of found is using the existing data will get you 80% of the way there. Um, and you get your funding target you kind of get, you start working towards your funding target. And then in that journey towards it, you can start improving the data. So I don't know if that answered your questions. But. Yeah. And I guess, I guess just a follow-up question then, Corey. So from the graphs that we see here, so if you're saying that's assets have already expired their usable shelf life. So is this curb here assuming that we would just have this like giant influx, like next year, let's say to replace all those assets that are expired for lack of a better word and then this would be the curve like going forward let's say we reset all those ones is that sort of the way that it works yeah so this is just the moving forward assets the ones that have already expired uh they're accounted for in another metric which we call past life asset ratio which we'll talk about in a second if you try and put those assets on this graph typically uh it'll just be like a big uh it'll be like a big spike here uh or look like this and then this graph will look just like tiny um, because the deficits. So it's just a total to different scale. Okay. Yeah. So it's a different scale. So I kind of leave it off for that reason. Number one, number two, I don't think it paints a great story of having a big line up there and it's accounted for in another metric, which we'll talk about in a second. Good question though. Any other questions? Cool. All right, let's uh, move on. So uh, now let's talk about risk and level service. This one's interesting. Uh, why is risk and level service important? Well, at the end of the day, it helps you inform your funding decisions. You know, if you want to take on more risk and you want to have a lower level service, well, guess what? You can spend less or you can invest less. Um, and there's lots of analogies that we'll get into. Uh, vice versa, right? You want less risk and you want higher level service you have to pay more. And the question though, so it helps you prioritize funding across funds, across asset categories. So that's kind of really the purpose and intent of it. And it allows you to kind of understand the trade-offs between those decisions. So that's the main purpose of it. It also helps you be informed with your decision-making. There's a billion different ways you can do uh, risk and level service. You can get carried away with it very, very quick. Uh, we keep it pretty high level. And I find this kind of thought process works very well for this type of planning. So uh, let's jump into it. So at the end of the day, how are we gonna kind of measure risk and level service? I like to look at these three core metrics. So I like to look at the, what I call the asset health score. And what is the asset health score? Well, it's informed by two metrics called the past life asset ratio and the consumption ratio. And together, I call these the asset vital signs. So just like uh, we can measure the health of our body, I think we can measure the health of our assets. So a vital sign maybe for our body might be blood cholesterol, cholesterol, heart rate. Those are the vital signs that go into understanding the overall health of our, our body. And so these basically are the vital signs that give us insights into the overall health of your assets. So what is it? So the past life asset ratio, what does that mean? It's the percentage of your asset portfolio past its estimated life um, as it relates to the total value. So say we own $100 in assets and $10 of those assets are past its life or estimated life, 10% of the asset portfolio is past its life, which means the past asset life ratio is 10%. If you own $100 in assets and $50 of them are past its life, there's a 50% ratio. So that's a key indicator of risk. And we'll get into that in a second. The consumption ratio is uh, related, but related in a way, it's just a measure of how far into the asset life are you. So if you have an asset that lasts 100 years and you're 50 years into that asset lifespan, it would be 50% consumed. 0% of it would be past its life. Why? It's only halfway into its life, but the consumption would be 50%. And what we do is we combine those two together 
to get what I call the asset health score. And it's important to think about these two together because it's not only a combination of what assets are already past its life, but how much are the other assets consumed? And it's really through those two lenses that can give you a clear picture um, into the state of the assets. So this is at a high level what we'll be using. And the reason why I'd like kind of using the health score approach too is I would love to kind of move the conversation or mindset away from community members is, you know, people say, let's keep taxes low. And I think the conversation needs to turn to like, let's keep our assets healthy uh, while considering affordability. So like, there's no dismissing affordability is not important. And we want to keep taxes as efficient as possible. But at the end of the day, if the assets are falling apart and people can't go to the parks and enjoy and there's potholes and water mains are breaking, uh, people won't move to the community. People's house values will go down and uh, it just won't be an enjoyable experience. So just maybe a little bit of a mindset shift is, is, you know, what's our health score and how can we keep it healthy compared to what's our taxes and how do we keep it, you know, uh, below a certain level. So, but we need to consider affordability. That's undeniable. So to help kind of understand this uh, framework, uh, I want you guys to imagine a bucket of water and I want you to imagine this bucket of water as a hole in it. And we're filling the bucket of water with some water and the water's draining. And there's a certain rate that the water's draining out and there's a certain rate that we're filling the bucket. And you can think about this as your assets. So the rate that they're deteriorating is the rate that the water's leaving the bucket. The rate that you're filling the bucket up with water is the rate that you're investing. And essentially, if we don't invest at a fast enough rate, eventually that bucket of water will be empty. And if we invest too much, the bucket will overfull. Uh, so our goal is to think about how full or empty do you really want that bucket of water. And the lower that bucket of water gets to the bottom, so the, the less you invest and the more you let it go down, the more at risk you are. Because if that water turns off or funding turns off, the bucket of water can go empty very quick if it's near the bottom. Now, if the bucket's very full to the top and the water turns off, you have more time to react and get things fixed to get the water flowing again. So what I want you to do is I want you to imagine every single one of your asset categories as a bucket of water that you're filling, your, i.e. you're investing, and that's deteriorating. And essentially, if we think about the metrics we just talked about, the consumption ratio is really how far down is that bucket of water. The past life asset ratio is the assets that we've estimated to pass their life, but they haven't quite left the bucket. So they're at risk. They could follow any second based on the information, but they haven't based on the data. We can't see exactly the shape of the bucket, but we've used our best estimated guess. And the health score is really a combination. It considers investment, deterioration, consumption, and the past life. So really want you to think about this, this bucket analogy. Uh, and we'll go through a couple of examples here and then we'll stop for, for conversation. So how does this all tie to risk and level service? So in general, the healthier assets are, the less assets that are past their life, the lower the consumption ratio, i.e. the fuller the bucket, uh, which means those assets have a lower risk of failing and they're gonna be providing a higher level of service. Now, the opposite's also true. The lower the health score, i.e. the lower the bucket, the more assets that are past its life, the higher the consumption ratio, the higher risk level of those assets failing and the lower level of service you're gonna be providing. And so it's a direct trade-off, directly correlated type uh, formula, if you will. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples just to wrap our head around it. And like I said, then we'll jump into discussion. So as an example, uh, if we have a transportation system, if it has an 82% health score, for 10% 10, 10 of those assets are past their expected life, and there's a 50% consumption ratio, meaning it's about halfway through its life. Now, if we compare that to a parks asset that has a 58% health score, 30% of the assets are past their life, and the consumption ratio is also 50. So in this example, you can see that transportation has 10% of the assets past their life, and parks has 30%. So parks, in this example, would have a higher risk of failure and would be providing a lower level of service relative to the transportation system. And so these become metrics for us to measure and understand this. Um, so we'll go through one more example and we'll have a discussion. Think about a car, right? So, uh, and, and the beauty thing about this whole process is there's no right or wrong way to think about it. It's just different lens. And it's about you guys as a community coming together to think about what's best. So imagine you got this awesome 1980 Toyota Corolla on the left-hand side or you have this brand new Honda Civic on the right-hand side. Now you're in Comox, you're driving to Tofino. The you know, Toyota Corolla on the left-hand side looks like it's pretty well-maintained, um, but it's a little bit of an older car. 
So more of the assets will be past its life. More of it's going to be consumed. It's going to have a lower health score. It's going to be lower in the bucket. Now, driving to Tofino, although it's still a reliable car, there is a higher chance that you're going to break down, which is a risk. Uh, you have to get towed. There's costs associated with that. And it's a lower level of service. It probably doesn't have a Bose stereo system, doesn't have air conditioning or a sunroof, probably no leather seats. Uh, so there's a lower level of service. Now, uh, on the right hand side, you got a brand new Honda Civic. Uh, you drive that between Tofino or Comox and Tofino. You have a lot less assets past its life. It's brand new, barely of it's consumed. You just drove it off the lot. The bucket's full. Um, there's a lot lower risk of you breaking down on that drive. And it's a much higher level of service. You got air conditioning, probably sunroof, probably a good stereo system, maybe leather seats. So, and this is kind of where we get into, there's no, it's not right or wrong to own a car on the left or a car on the right. They just come with different risks and level of services and different costs associated with it. So that's kind of the analogy. And I just want to pause here because it's very important, I think, to understand the health score the past life and the consumption ratio and how it kind of blends into risk and level of service. So any questions that you'd love to kind of double click on uh, related to this? Corey, can you go back uh, at one slide? Yeah. Yeah. So this right here, there was some questions, some really good questions in the budget process this year of, you know, um, staff is submitting in these capital projects and council needs to go through each capital project. And it's hard to understand, well, do we need to do this? Do we need to do that? If we move to this type of system, what council then does, instead of approving individual projects, you approve across a service type, like transportation parks, what level of risk you're willing to accept and what level of service you expect out of those assets. And then from there, staff goes and we do our capital replacement based on those decisions that council has been made. So it moves you away from looking to have to approve individual projects and rather what you're looking to approve is the service level and cost of the assets in each category. So it allows you to kind of visualize, this is what I want my parks to look like. Staff comes back and tells you, this is what the cost is gonna to be to do that. And you say, okay, it's too much. We bring the level, uh, the level of service and what those parks look like down a little bit. So council gets much more into deciding the level of service and the cost and not into looking at each of the projects as they come up and having to decide whether you know, this specific park needs to be uh, worked on or this specific water main needs to be replaced this year. Thanks for sharing, Jordan. I think that was a great kind of uh, provided a lot of context and a real example. Uh, is there any other questions? Um, Councillor okay. Minions has a question. Yeah, just a quick question with, uh, with what Jordan just said. So in a funding plan, how many different categories would we be looking at approximately? Like if recreation was one, roads was one, I'm assuming we probably would kind of take time to go through each one if it, it made that kind of blanket approach. So how many yeah. roughly would we be looking at in a plan? Yeah, so just on the timeline of this, this is gonna be a long conversation. This isn't gonna be something that council hammers off in a couple of months. This is a year, two years to get to where we wanna go, but you have your, your roads, you have your water system, you have your sewer system, you have your parks, um, and then you have basically whatever you can, council can break it down into whatever service category you want. You say, you may say, listen, we're going to lump the marina in with the parks and that's all going to be maintained to a certain one. Or you may say, actually, we want the marina maintained at a higher level than we want from the parks because we get more money out of it, right? So it can really break down into whatever level of service council wants to, um, wants to get into. Okay, Councillor Grant. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Um, I think when the earth was still cooling and I first got elected, this was one of those issues that I, I came to. Didn't really know how to do it, but knew that it was important. And, and I think that it's, um, you know, I remember thinking that if there's a hill to die on, this is probably the one. Because, you know, if you don't have healthy infrastructure and all this, then it doesn't just doesn't work. And, and when Jordan got here, the budget process really changed. So I'm really happy to kind of hear what you're saying, because it really starts to make more sense to me, at least, as to how the budget process can go in this. So, um, I, you know, I'm really listening. Of course, you know, there is a tolerance level that we hit with with taxation, but 
if you don't have all the infrastructure looked after, it really doesn't, you know, you're, you're going to get hammered for these 10 and 20 and 30 percent increases that some communities enjoy. So um, I'm really interested to see how this plays out, but I'm really quite enjoying, I can't believe I'm saying enjoying asset management, but but it's, uh, you know, it's really interesting because it's something that I've really, you know, we started putting money aside years ago, but just doing it in a very more haphazard way. So this is actually bringing some real meat to the bone. So uh, I, I'm really, uh, really glad to hear this. It'd be interesting to see where we get to and what our tax uh, tolerance is to make this all work. Corey, can you bring up the slide you had that showed, I think it was the $5 million? Uh, yeah, the $5 million line with the assets going up and down below it. Yeah, let me go back here. My slides are a little bit uh, slow and, and I guess just why this is uh, flipping back here. Um, yeah, appreciate your warm words and enthusiasm uh, towards this. You know, it's uh, super important to kind of get everyone uh, conversing around it in, in a positive way. So. Appreciate your warm words and, and enthusiasm. And, and Jordan, was this the slide you were referring to? Yeah, yeah, this is the one. So um, I know I asked council this year to take a, a fairly large leap of faith in the way I was constructing the budgets. And, and as you mentioned, it was different than how, how it's been done. And one of the, the bigger changes I think that council may have found was uh, you asked me the question, well, if we take these capital projects out, how much can we decrease the taxes by? And I said zero. And I think that was a bit of a surprise, but I'm hoping now going through this, it makes a bit more sense. So that $5 million, if you take the money that's to be spent in year one and decide you're not going to spend it in year one and move it to year two, that $5 million number doesn't change very much. It will change by uh, you've extended the life of that asset for one year. Let's say it's a 20 year asset. So you're going to get that 5% um, reduction of the value of that asset off the 5 million. But you can start to see by delaying one piece of asset by one year, it doesn't change that number very much, which is why the changes in the taxes don't. Where you really start to see the impact on what the tax levels are going to be or are required is when you start to set the overall asset health scores across the entire value of the assets within the town. And Corey, do we have an estimate on the total asset value of the town? Yeah, it's a good uh, question. And it's actually the next slide that we are about to get into. Um, so nicely teed up. Um, let me just go to it. Uh, you guys have done this before. <laughs> so there we go. There we go. Uh, so that's the total. That's the total value. Yeah, check your check for your check for your wallets on the way out the door. <laughs> Yeah, so 200. And so that's where it goes when you start going and trying to say, okay, well, if we do, if we move one project, it doesn't actually impact the amount of funds that we need. But when you start to look at the fact that this council has control over the value of about $250 million in assets, now that 5% across all of our assets is a huge number, right? So the 5% that you're going to get out of delaying one asset one year, not a lot of money, not a lot of impact. But what we're trying to do is turn over control to you of $250 million of assets. And that's when those decisions become very large on what the community is going to look like and how much the community is going to have to pay uh, for the assets that we have. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Jordan, and, and kind of build on that. I think it's a cool, like, I don't think people in the community fully understand how expensive infrastructure can be. You know, 250 million, it's like can blow your mind pretty quick. Uh, but I think it's a cool, fun fact to share, number one. And number two, it's something to be proud of. Like, essentially, at the end of the day, you guys are on the board of directors for a company that's there for the greater good of community called a uh, community. And you guys are the council and you're responsible for managing this $250 million dollars. And I don't know too many people that get to do that. So I think that's a, a really cool thing uh, to bring up, to be proud of and to share. To help put it into perspective for the community, we should find how much, how, how much wood we have in all of our infrastructure and they can start to see just how expensive everything is. I was just gonna say we should <clears throat> open a lumber mill and we could probably get that money back pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Replace all your wood beams there with uh, concrete beams and you'll be good. No, I just mean a two by four, eight foot is eight bucks right now. So we just mill a few of the trees and we'll get that money back. Exactly. Well, it used to be the, the feet. It used to be the thieves would go out on the railroads and steal the ties. Now they're stealing the, the tuba or the, the lumber underneath and leaving the ties. Yeah. 
Cool. Um, awesome. Any other questions about this before we kind of jump on to the next slide? All yours. Awesome. Uh, and fun fact, if you divide it by approximately how many people live in Comox, there's about 15,000 people. It's probably changed. It's about 16 or $17,000 per person. Uh, that includes, you know, babies, families, et cetera. So another cool one is by household. I actually don't have that one off by hand, but I think it's, it's an interesting uh, one to have in mind. So um, where do you guys stand today? So we, we talked a little bit about these health scores, these vital signs. Where does a town of Comox stand today? Um, so overall, the overall asset health score is around 95%. About 3% of the assets are past their estimated life. And there it's about 47% consumed, which means it's about halfway through its life. Now, keep in mind, we've adjusted the asset service life based on the operator's knowledge or input. So these numbers have dropped significantly. Uh, if you actually use the industry best practice numbers, um, I think the amount of assets past its life around 10 or 15%. So just simply through that exercise, we've kind of been able to calibrate and hone that in uh, quite a bit. Um, and one thing I should have off uh, for you guys is I think it's interesting, but not something to latch on to too much. But you know, if you think about 250 million, just running the math real quick, uh, 3% of that is about seven and a half million dollars in infrastructure that's past its estimated life today. So it kind of gives some more context to the 3%. I think when you look at it in a dollar figure, it looks pretty crazy. Uh, when you look at a percentage, it's like, okay, we're, we're doing not bad today. And that's why I like to represent it in the percentage. So um, this is kind of the overall picture of where Comox uh, sits today. We'll, we'll have a little conversation around this in a sec. So we'll, we'll answer some questions. Now, if we double clicked on that and we look by fund, and we can actually look by category as well, but we won't today for the sake of conversation and speed. Um, you can see the breakdown between the water fund, the sewer fund, and the general capital fund. Majority of the values in general capital fund, about 180 million. Uh, water sewer is very similar. Why? Well, where sewer pipes are, typically water pipes are, uh, et cetera. Um, and you can see the breakdown. So the water fund has about 5% of its assets past its estimated life. So I believe earlier we are talking about some Water assets, where are those accounted for that might be past their life? Well, essentially that's where they are. So if you take 5% of 33 million, again, just running some quick uh, math for you guys, I should be able to do that off the top of my head. Uh, it's about 1.7 million. Um, so those are the assets that are past its life. And you can see that in general, everything's around 40, 50%. So the assets are about halfway through its life, which is a, a good position to be in. And then you can see the asset health score corresponding is, is calculated there. So how do you kind of sit against other communities? I would say you're right in the middle of the pack. Most communities are around a 50% health score. In fact, I'd say Comox is maybe in a little bit of a better position than most communities for a couple of reasons, uh, but the, the health scores are a little bit better because we've honed them in based on the estimated lifespans. And I know that you guys have done a great job at, at keeping debt low and stuff, which will help set you up for success in the future. It might not be the best strategy moving forward, and we'll talk about pros and cons. Uh, that's a whole issue in itself. Uh, but that's basically a current snapshot of Town of Comox infrastructure today. So, uh, so Corey, if you, mm -hmm. so if I look at water fund, it says consumption rate fifty percent. Yeah. How long is that in real years? Like, is that is it? Have we got fifty years left, or have we got five years left? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't have that stat or that data. And now that you bring it up, honestly, it probably would be a really good one to know. Uh, so note it. Uh, it's a very sophisticated question. Uh, never been asked that before. So definitely noted. Um, but yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think what's kind of important, probably more than the average number of, of years on that is looking at that funding demand chart. That's really kind of showing you where the wave of expenditures are. And if you recall back a couple slides, which I go to, uh, you can see that most of the demand in the water system is kind of in this middle term uh, fee. So how many years are left? Uh, that's, I think, a really good metric to actually add. But this is kind of the wave that we're, we're going to start thinking to manage. So if we, so if we keep funding at a level it is, and we'll see this, you'll see the amount of assets that go past its life will significantly go up in this period because we haven't financially planned for the replacement of them. So I don't know if that 
answered your question. I don't think it did, uh, but thank you for the, the tip there. Well, no, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, if there's two years left and we have to run through an election on this or whether I'll be dead before we get to the other end, because then I don't really care. Right? But, but it's just, you know, I mean, I think you need to know a number there so you can really get a feel for how long you have left in, on some of these things. Yeah, hundred percent. It's a, it's a good point and, and noted. Um, and I think what will kind of under help you guys to understand the impact decisions today have on the future. That was one of the challenges we talked about at the very beginning is you'd sit there and, and, and before it kind of like, Oh, here's life cycle. Here's current. Oh, let's increase it 1%. But no one really understood. What does that truly mean for our community in 20, 30, 15 years? Like, what do these decisions mean? So we'll see in a couple slides how we can actually measure the impact uh, decisions today have on the future. So, you know, I think that's a, a good lens to kind of take uh, to decision making too. So uh, good question. And I think we'll we'll jump into a little bit deeper in a few slides. Cool. Uh, let's jump on to the next one. So uh, we know where we're at today. And I think, you know, I think it's a great kind of starting point. You can kind of put one pig in the ground, but the question is, or the challenge I'd like to bring to you guys today is what do you want the future to be like 20, 30 years out? Like what, what do you want the future of Comox to be like? Like let's be visionaries a bit and let's think about where do we want the community to go? Do you want the health score to go up? Do you want it to go down? Do you want it to stay the same? And what does that all mean for us? So that's what we're going to explore next uh, together. Um, so how do we do that? So what we start looking at is what we call a service sustainability score. So this measures the relative kind of quality that is desired from a service. And there's two lenses that we take on it. The first lens is the risk lens. So what's the, what's the relative impact if an ASCAT were to fail on public safety, on the environment, on finances, and the reputation of the community? That's kind of one lens. Then the other lens is level of service. So how do you measure the relative quality desired from a service? And depending on the lens, you might have completely different answers. So maybe for water, uh, you want you have a really low tolerance for risk, but the people want a high level service. So it just depends on the lens. And we'll put some meat to this about how we actually analyze it. So what we've done for each of the asset categories, water, sewer, transportation, fleet, equipment, all the assets, we've kind of assigned a score one to five. Uh, one being like a low score. So if it's a level service one, it's it's it doesn't need a high level service. If it's a five, it needs a high level service. And risk, same thing. If it's a one, it has a low risk of, of failure. Um, and if it's five, it's a high risk. So if an asset category gets a one and a one, it would get a service sustainability score of one, meaning it's not as important as maybe other asset categories. So maybe we can actually drop our health score and invest less in that. Now on the other end of the spectrum, maybe the level of service is a five, people really care about it, and it's a high risk of failure to finances, reputation, et cetera, it would get a service sustainability score of 25. And really the range of that will help inform us about what funding levels we want by asset category. So what we've done, uh, we did workshops with uh, staff and we looked at each one of your major asset categories, which you can see down the side, water, sewer, storm, transportation, buildings, land improvement. And we've kind of ranked and rated the different criteria. Uh, so we weighed it public safety versus environment versus financial versus reputation. And we added a score one to five for each of those. So for water, uh, there's a score of five for public safety. Uh, for environment, if it was the risk, the impact on the environment, it's a three. For financial, it was a four and reputation is a four. And we had a little bit of a grading system. I'm not gonna go into the details of that today, but at a high level, this is the risk lens on your asset category. So what the key takeaways here are, water and sewer have the highest risk of failure. Uh, overall, you can see on this column. Uh, next in line is kind of storm transportation and buildings. Next is land improvements or people know them as parks and equipment. So that's uh, a peer risk lens. Now we've also taken the other lens, which is level of service. Let me just uh, jump in there really quickly sure. and say, um, Public Works was not happy about equipment being scored that low. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I think it's it's a good point to kind of bring up, uh, you know, because I, I think the main thing is to make sure this picture doesn't paint it that the asset's not important. It's that relative to the other asset categories, it has less of an impact on risk. Um, so that's kind of the lens to take. No asset's not important. Every asset's important. It's just which one has a higher impact 
uh, to risk. So say for equipment, uh, you know, all staff want their assets to kind of have, you know, be up there and protect them. Uh, but when we had a broad holistic discussion, which I thought was a healthy one, different departments could kind of see, oh, this is why maybe funding needs to be directed here or here. Um, that was a key takeaway, at least for me. Um, so when we kind of take a level service lens, which is a completely different lens on something, we looked at, you know, what's the benefit this asset provides to the community? How many services benefit, how many citizens benefit from the service? Criticality, how critical is it to the well-being? Is it essential? Is it a non-essential service? And does this asset support the local economy? In other words, does it support businesses and financial aspects in the economy of, of the community? Um, and again, we took a lens on that for all the assets. Uh, and again, this is where it ranked out. So water and sewer, again, ranked highest, but higher than the risk lens, which I thought was quite interesting. Now, it also tied with transportation. So what was interesting is when we look at a risk lens, transportation was a little bit lower. But when we look at it from a level service lens, it was a little bit higher. So it was a five because people drive on the roads, they see them. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, storm was next online. And then buildings, land improvements, and, and poor equipment, uh, again, in both scenarios, was ranked uh, lower. Um, and then what we did is we combined these two together to get what I call the service sustainability score. So you can see the risk scores and level service scores and then the service sustainability score. So instantly at a glance, you can kind of see at a high level where to prioritize funding or in other words, what assets maybe should be more healthy. So sewer ranked the highest, 21. Uh, water was very close and behind. Then transportation. So water, sewer, transportation. Next, uh, it was storm, then buildings, then equipment, and then land improvements, uh, lastly. And so this is kind of a snapshot on kind of the uh, perception of risk and level service on the assets. So um, before I kind of jump to discussion, I want to kind of go over one more thing. So why does this all matter? Like this just seems like a bunch of numbers put on a table. Well, it directly informs uh, our funding levels and the health scores that we want. Because as I posed to you guys a few slides back, what do we want the health score to be? You know, how do we make that decision? This will help kind of inform that. So the service sustainability score is directly correlated to the vital signs. So the more, the higher the vital signs or the more healthy assets are, or the less assets that are past their life and the less that's consumed, what do we know? That means lower risk level and a higher level of service. So what does that mean? The service sustainability score is higher. So for, for high service sustainability score assets, water, sewer, we probably want better health scores. And the opposite is also true. Those with the lower service sustainability score, you know what, we'll cognizantly, we'll, we'll make not an effort, but we'll make like a decision to allow that asset health score to be lower than the ones with the higher service sustainability score. Why? Because they have a lower risk and level service level to the community. So this becomes a lens to be able to help prioritize funding amongst categories. So that I'll pause there and open it to discussion around, um, yeah, risk and level service. What does it mean? How is it measured? And the service sustainability score uh, concept. So any questions? Seeing none, carry on. Cool. Um, so this is the most interesting part of the presentation. I uh, appreciate you guys staying with us uh, so far, but this is about the money. So this is the forecasted asset replacement budget. Now, why is this important? Well, funding dictates everything. It drives taxation, it drives impact to people, it drives how much projects you guys can do, et cetera. Um, we're not getting in today about how this is gonna get funded. So we're not talking about what's the impact to taxation, what's the impact to the reserve, what's the impact to debt, that's a future uh, thing or a next step to worry about. Today, we're just gonna be looking at what is that average annual investment required to hit certain health scores and what's the impact of lowering that budget? So we'll see a direct correlation. We'll look at four scenarios. Uh, if we spend more, what's the health score in 30 years? If we spend less, what's the health score in 30 years, et cetera. So um, in general, the more that we invest, the higher the asset vital signs or the higher the health score. Now, the less we invest, the lower the health score and the lower the vital signs. And so to bring everything together, just to kind of wrap things up into a little ball before we jump into it, is this is the overall model. So at the end of the day, we take the data, we calculate the consumption and past life ratio. We use those two to get the health score. We then use the service sustainability score, which is informed by consequence and level of service 
to set the service sustainability score by category. That service sustainability score will inform the level of our health score, which will impact our forecasted budget. So you can think about this kind of like a flow or a machine or a process. And that's how essentially we landed on the forecasted budget. So we're gonna go through four scenarios today together uh, and explore each of them. So the first one that we did is what's the impact of the status quo on our health score or on our vital signs? If we keep doing what we're doing, what does that mean 30 years down the line? To someone's point, you know, uh, do I care if it's, you know, if I'm gonna be gone by the time these assets are, are, are gone? Well, this will show you the impact of that decision. Now, scenario number two, we said, let's keep risk and level of service the same. We generally know what's going on in the community today. Why if we just keep it the same? What is the budget associated with that? Uh, we also looked at scenario three, which is where we began to prioritize the budget based on the service sustainability score. So in this scenario, we allowed assets with a high service sustainability score. So the ones that ranked high on risk and level service lens, we allow 10% of those assets to go past their life. Why do we let an asset go past its life? They're still estimates, but they're based on the knowledge of operation staff, but it measures a, a, a risk tolerance. So we'll allow high uh, assets to go 10% past their life. We'll allow medium assets to go 15% past their life. And we'll allow low uh, assets to go 20%. So that was kind of the conversation. Then the next one, we kind of added 5% to that. So we said, let's still prioritize funding based on the service sustainability score, but a lot, let's allow assets that have that high service sustainability target to go 15% past their life, the medium ones to go 20% past its life, and the low ones to go 25% past their life. And these are kind of the, the dials that we can turn to kind of show you the impact of risk and the cost. So we're gonna go through each of those scenarios and. Before I jump into it, maybe I'll just quickly pause. Do you have any questions about the scenarios? Uh, and they'll make a lot more sense in like two minutes, but just thought I'd quickly pause. Any questions? Uh, no. Okay, carry on, Corey. Cool. Thank you. So scenario one, let's dive in. Uh, so status quo. Uh, so this is the reserve contributions as per the 2020. So there's about $3.7 million uh, that's being budgeted or can be budgeted for asset replacement. Now, there's a caveat with this number is sometimes these funds get used for non-replacement like for like. So if someone's like, hey, we wanna you know, build something new or we need a level of service increase or we wanna like build this park that wasn't there, that takes away from this. So this is under the assumption that every dollar that is, is basically put in the reserve is used for asset replacement in perpetuity over the next 30 years. So that's what this kind of scenario uh, projects. So let's look into the future uh, 30 years. What's the impact on the health score? So the health score actually will drop from 95 to 65. So it's declining. The amount of assets that are past its life will move from 3% or about 7.5 million all the way up to 21%. Uh, which I should probably have the number on that, which I'll get in a sec, but 21% past its life. The consumption ratio will move from 47 to 67%. So what does that mean? Well, there's going to be higher risk of asset failure. Why? More assets are past their life and the consumption ratio is higher. And there's going to be a little bit of a lower level of service than there is um, today. And we do have this breakdown by fund and by category. We won't get into that today because I think it's just a little overwhelming as Jordan mentioned, this is a, a start of a little bit of a journey. Um, so just something to kind of uh, take away there. And what is the funding gap? Well, technically there's zero funding gap. Why? Because the current budget is the same as the forecasted budget. So there's no gap between current and what's forecasted in the model. And so no gap in this scenario. Um, so that's scenario one. Scenario two, uh, what we looked at is we said, let's keep the asset health score the same. So we generally know you know, you guys can look around Comox, who, who cares what the health score is, it was 50 or 90 or whatever. You guys know, you look around, you can see exactly what's going on. So this was our goal was like, let's keep the health score about the same in 30 years. What budget would be required for that? And what would that mean? Well, risk and level of service today will be the same in the future. So that would require about a $5.355 million a year investment into asset replacement. What does that mean for your health score? Well, it stays at 95. So about 3% of the assets are past their life today. 2% are past their life in the future. Very similar situation. 47% consumption today, 48% in the future. So generally speaking, if you were to invest that, uh, the community would probably be in a similar 
position, or at least that's what the, the data kind of supports. Now, what would be the funding gap if you guys were to kind of move up to this funding level? Well, we'd have to move from 3.7 million to 5.36 million, which is about a uh, $1,640,000 funding gap. So that's how we would have to increase our annual contribution to the reserve uh, to get to that level. So I think that's kind of paints one picture. Um, and let's explore scenario three. So in this scenario, what we started doing is we said, let's prioritize funding based on the service sustainability score. So you remember that score we came up with? And as mentioned before, we allowed all assets in the high category to go 10% past their life. We're gonna allow them to go past their life. Yes, there's risk with that, but that's the cool thing about this kind of trade-off. We, we take on a little more risk, we can drop funding. We allowed the medium assets, with the medium service sustainability scores to go 15% past their life. And we allowed the low assets in the low service sustainability category to go 20. And again, the, the reason they're going up from high to low is you know, not that they're, they're a little bit less important from a service sustainability perspective. So we'll allow more of them to go past their life and we'll invest less. So the budget in this one came out to about 4.756362 million. Argument's sake, $4.8 million if we just round up. So that's that lens. What does that mean for your health score in 30 years? Uh, it moved from a 95 to an 88. So you'll see a slight drop. The amount of assets past their life will go from 3% overall to 9%. And the consumption ratio will go from 47 to 55. So what does that mean? Well, there's a little bit more assets past their life. So a slight increase in risk, slight reduction in level of service. But overall, I would still say in, in a fairly healthy position. Um, what does the funding gap uh, look like in this scenario? Uh, that's a wrong uh, amount. It should be 5.4 million minus the 4.4. So I think it's around 600,000 actually. Uh, so I should update that slide. So there's about a $600,000 funding gap in this scenario. So that's a mistake, that's my bad. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, scenario number four, this is where we actually increased risk a little bit higher and drop level service a little bit more. So what did we look into? Uh, what we looked into, actually this is, uh, just one sec guys. This is, I have a feeling I have the wrong slide here for you. I had two slides open. Sorry, I was on a roll there. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, let me share this one. There we go. Oh, let me reshare my screen. Okay, um, so this scenario, we said, let's add 5% to the uh, amount of assets that we allow go past their life. So for the high assets, let's allow 15% instead of 10 to go past their life. For the medium, uh, instead of 15, let's go 20. And instead of the 20, let's go 25. And so that drops it down to 4.3406, whatever that is, $4.3 million per year. So you can see that as you take on more risk, as you allow more assets to go past their life, you can drop the funding level a little bit further. So that's an interesting takeaway there. Uh, what's the impact on your health score in 30 years? It's gonna move from a 95 to an 82. And in essence, your amount of assets past your life are gonna move from 3% to 14% instead of the 9%. And the consumption ratio is gonna move from 47 to 60. So that's kind of the direction. What will you expect? You know, more risk of failure, lower level service, um, a little bit more than the previous scenario, which we'll get into and a lot better than say the first scenario, which is uh, that one. So if we look at the forecasted kind of budget here, uh, we got 3.71 million, the 4.34 million, which works out to about $630,000 in, in funding gap. So that's kind of where you guys stand. And I'll go through a summary, it'll tie it all together and then let's have a good conversation uh, around this. So um, overall, I just kind of want to say that Town of Comox uh, and all communities across Canada have been doing a really good job at planning for operation and maintenance, but they haven't been doing a great job at capital asset replacement. So you're not alone. Uh, there, every community across Canada is having these same conversations. Uh, and I think Comox has been very proactive, as someone mentioned, putting money away even before this. I think that was very intelligent and there's a lot of foresight there. Um, you guys have about $250 million in assets about 3% of the assets are past their life. What I've kind of typically seen, it's between 10 and 30% for communities across BC. 
It's a little bit higher than Comox, but most of them are using industry best practice service life. So that's why it's bumped up again. Um, most of your assets are about 47% consumed. Most communities I see around 40 to 65. Again, they're using industry best practice and your overall health score is 95. What I see typical is kind of 70 to 80. Um, why I say are you this similar position as most communities is because if you actually use your industry best practice levels, you get to kind of those benchmark uh, numbers. So we looked at all these different scenarios together. Uh, scenario one, what was the impact of the status quo? Uh, you know, in 30 years, your health score would drop to 65, 20% of the assets would be past our life and 67% consumed. In scenarios two, we said, how do we keep the health score the same? So it was a 95 and basically you're in the similar position today. In the third scenario, we prioritized based on the service sustainability score. We allowed some assets to go past their life uh, to varying levels based on that score. And at the end, we had about 10% of the assets pass their life and a 55% consumption ratio. And in the last scenario, we allowed even more assets to go past their life, which you can see the drop in the asset health score. So the main takeaway here, you can see the lever. You invest more, you have a higher health score, you have lower risk, higher level of service, and the opposite is also true. And now you have three core metrics that you can kind of twist the dial and see the impact these decisions have uh, in your future. So overall, uh, if we look at the funding levels, uh, current is 3.71. Scenario two, which is same risk and level of service today, 5.36. Uh, scenario three, uh, let's drop health score down to an 88, 4.76. And scenario four, where we drop it down to an 82, it's 4.34. So you can see the varying levels of funding. You can also see the funding gap. Uh, so this slide's uh, calculated correct. So we can see the comparison. In scenario one, there's no funding gap because what we're spending is what we forecasted. In scenario two, uh, between what we're spending and what we forecasted, there's about a $1.6 million funding gap. And in scenario three, there's about a $1.05 million funding gap. And in scenario four, there's a $630,000 funding gap. So the key takeaway here is as you drop your funding level, the funding gap will drop, but your health score as a result is also going to drop. Um, and this side really, I think, just ties it all together. And I'll kind of explain this and then we'll probably have a, have a good conversation here. So you can look at oops, each of the scenarios. We can see the starting and ending health score, starting and ending past life asset and consumption ratio. We can see risk and level of service change and we can see the change in the asset value. So I won't read through all these, but we'll keep it on here for discussion. And I'll just draw attention to the bottom part of the screen. Uh, so number one, Scenario one, we'll see the biggest increase in risk and the biggest drop in level of service. That's the status quo. That's if we keep doing what we're doing. Scenario two, we'll kind of keep things about the same. That's why the line's straight across. Scenario three, you'll see an increase in risk and a drop in level of service, but less than say scenario one. And scenario four, you'll also see an increase in risk and a drop in level of service, but less than scenario three. So uh, the last thing I'll go through is the change in asset value. So the change in the asset value is essentially what's the difference between the uh, scenario two value and what you're currently at. So if, if you were to actually fund assets at the value to keep the health score the same, you know, the asset value in scenario one is actually decreasing at about 1.64 million a year. In scenario two, three, uh, it's dropping at about $600,000 per year over time. And in scenario four, it's dropping in about $1.02 million a year. So that just helps future councils kind of think like if they want to adjust level of service, how much do we need to kind of adjust funding? Um, so I'll pause here. That was a lot of information. Uh, and I would love to open it up to some discussion. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Bissinger. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, Corey. I find this stuff really interesting in terms of like theory and, you know, everything. Um, I guess, projecting the health of our, of our services going forward. But I, I'm just trying to dial it down to like, what does this look like for staff to implement this? Like how, like this report, sure, we're saying, you know, the difference between 4.5 to 5.3. I mean, that's like a 10% difference a year, which could change based on how busy certain contractors are in the area, so on and so forth. So, I, you know, I, I see that as like pretty minor differences, achieving different levels of services overall. So I, I can appreciate that, but I'm just trying to see like, okay, so out of this, what, how do staff implement this? What comes out? Like, are we given a 25 year schedule of, you know, replace sewer and water 
while you're replacing the road for X, Y, Z streets or like how, you know, like I, I, I appreciate the theory and I appreciate the concept. I'm just trying to see like how, how is that implemented in a municipality? How does it relate to, you know, how staffed or short staffed we are for maintenance operations, so on and so forth, you know, for engineering, like, you know, there's, like I said, like 4.76 million to 4.3 million, that's 400 K, which can, you know, one change order, they run into X, Y, Z when they're putting in a, a sewer line and there's your 400 K there if you're doing a, a long road or sewer for example and how does it all tie into when a road needs to be resurfaced versus when the storm needs to be redone and when the, the water needs to be redone for example so I'm just trying to see like practically how does that all work how do we um I guess implement all this like yeah, and maybe maybe the question's not for you I don't know <laughs> it's a great question I might let Jordan jump in and then I can jump in after Jordan do you want to kind of uh, share your thoughts there and then I can I can jump in as well yeah, so I think how we operationalize this is having targets set by council at the level of it, the infrastructure to maintain things at. So right now, staff is doing everything that you said in, in making those plans, but we're doing it to set, we're doing it to reach the targets that staff feel council may want to implement, right? So really, it just gets council to change those targets, and then we have to go and operationalize those. So yeah, we will project out 25 years what needs to be replaced, but are we going into that believing that on that exact year in 25 years, this is going to be done? I'd say, no, it would be the same. You start to really look at it when those assets become within that five-year range, which comes onto your budget forecast. And then when you get down to the one, two-year range, you really know what's going to happen. And then we would still be looking at the different trade-offs that you have for replacing something. So let's say you have a, um, you have a road that is, getting to the point of replacement because it is reaching the asset score, asset health score that council wants the replacement to be at, but you have a water line underneath it that's gonna last for seven more years. Then we're still going to be taking a look at that trade-off and making sure that we replace the water lined up with when we replace the roads. So it's not an exact standard that's going to be met every time. We're still gonna be making sure we're replacing things in the most efficient and effective way um, possible. And when it comes down to something like I just mentioned, where there's that wide of a gap, that may be something that we bring to council and say, council, your road health score target was this, um, your uh, water system health score target was this. Do you want to replace this road now, which means we need to do the water. And if you do, here is the value you've lost from your water system by replacing it seven, replacing this piece of water infrastructure now you've lost seven years of value out of it. Here is the value you've lost. And I think that'll really change the conversation um, when council has to make those decisions because right now you're going, well, yeah, okay, we want the roads to be repaired because that makes sense. And we don't want the roads to depreciate. Whereas in the future, we may be coming to you and saying, by replacing this road now, you're going to lose $75,000 of value out of um, your water infrastructure. So it's not to say that these conversations aren't going to happen or that council can set this and leave it, but I think it'll allow you to see the actual financial impacts of the infrastructure decisions you're making when you get to that point. Yeah. I guess, Jordan, can I, can I just ask a, ask a follow-up to that? So for example, you know, we're saying, let's say we just pick a specific road, let's say, I don't know, Anderton, just because I live on Anderton. So you know, is, is that report from the asset management plan going to tell us like, okay, so Anderton Road, like the storm has 25 years left, the water line has 15 years left, the road itself is another 10 years, and the sewer is another, whatever, 15 years, like, are we going to know that information to that extent? And then staff will be able to actually tell us that or are we kind of just like, guessing as we go, like, I know, you know, we were saying data integrity, we have like roughly 80% go so I guess the staff can be able to make those recommendations based on like having that information yeah that, time. that's correct and so we we can take um you know a look at when we think these uh infrastructure needs to be replaced just on the general engineering practices and then as we use them and, and um, input the data into our GIS system we'll change those projections on how long the infrastructure will last and we're part of this is also doing the asset studies. So, you know, within the next three years, we have major asset studies coming on portions of our water system, sewer system, and, uh, you know, council is just about to receive updates on the transportation system. So we need to continually evaluate these and we're going to continue to update the 
information that gets put into our life projection. So what we have today as a life projection for our assets are not set in stone. They're going to change as more information comes in. And through doing proper operation and maintenance, which is not part of what we're looking at here, right? But to make sure that we're funding the regular operation and maintenance so we can stretch that asset value out as long as possible. Um, because in many cases, and, and I think council's aware of this, putting $100,000 into a, you know, a $2 million asset when it's needed, you might be able to stretch the life out of it to the point where that gets a good value on return. So it's a constant process and the information that we have now is not going to be the information we use in 25 years, but the information we have now gives us a picture in 25 years where it's going to be. And as we get closer to those times or as assets start to break, um, we're going to be doing the studies to make sure that we understand exactly when those assets need to be replaced in order to maintain the infrastructure level or asset health score that council wants to see. Yeah, and I'll just quickly jump in there and then Pat will we'll get you on the stand there. Um, so yeah, Alex, I think Jordan nailed that 100%. And just to kind of quickly uh, just add on, on there a little bit, our compliment is I really, how do you operationalize this? Well, at the end of the day, uh, there's kind of two steps in my opinion, well, a couple steps, but you know, this first step is like trying to figure out how big does the bag of money need to be or how much do we need to roughly be investing and then creating a financial strategy to get you there. Once you unlock capital, now the next challenge is how do we best deploy that capital? And that's kind of capital planning kind of questions. And so does this data get into the detail of like planning multi-utility projects? No, not yet. It's not that detailed. But is that something you want to skate towards? 100%. But that becomes a, a challenge, a problem that gets created after you get your funding levels in order. Then the next question is how do we most efficiently deploy this? That's when you got to start investing in more significant GIS systems, capital planning programs, all this sort of thing. But this is kind of the first step in, in a journey. Uh, it took communities 20, 30 years, 50 years to get here. Uh, it'll take them a few to, to get more sophisticated. Now. So hopefully that helps uh, provide yeah, thank some you. context. Thank you, Jordan. One, one more quick addition is that, you know, the numbers that you're seeing here seem very solid and stable and um, they're going to change. It'll be interesting maybe one day to bring Clive in and let you guys look beneath the hood of just how complicated um, and vast the amount of data is that we have collected that goes into this and, and just the interplay between those, that, those pieces of information. Um, I know myself when Clive starts going into the, the spreadsheets that are required to bring all this up, I'm, I'm lost within five minutes and he's barely scratched the surface. So Okay, thanks. We had Councillor Minions and then I believe Councillor McKenna. Okay, good. Yeah, this should be a pretty quick question. I think previous councils have done a really good job about normalizing and kind of having predictability with the tax rate being pretty stable across the board. So I think this will continue that trend of knowing kind of what to expect. If, for example, we were to go into something like a scenario four, um, just in theory, and you're looking at something like getting to an 8% tax rate, I'm just assuming that inflation wouldn't be built into these kind of uh, numbers just from. So we, assumption. yeah, we are using the current value replacement. And so we, we all, I think we all realize that when it comes time to replace these assets, they're going to be more expensive than what we're projecting right now. And the way we try to manage that is the investment, the, the investment we return on the, the, the monetary assets we have in the bank are reinvested into the um, capital savings. So that will help keep up with inflation. So that's really the strategy that Clive has been doing. And he's been very successful at that in going out, getting good interest rates, as good as municipalities can get, and just reinvesting those dividends every year to make sure that we can keep up with the future um, replacement. And if we start to lose, um, lose our pegging to that, then we're going to have to increase the amount that we're bringing in each year. But right now, uh, we're pretty okay with that strategy. Having said that, that strategy was developed six months ago and the cost of things um, now are quite different. But with the long-term 30-year horizon that we're looking at, it allows things to come up. And I think, you know, I hope we can all expect the price of everything, you know, by next year to settle out and be down at a more reasonable level. Yeah, I just wanted to say the scenarios look less scary than I was expecting. So if inflation could be built in through interest, I think that's a great thing. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor yeah, and, and maybe just one quick, quick thing to... to to build on that. When you build a financial strategy, uh, I like to kind of get the impact to say taxation eventually, like that's in the future phase. 
Uh, but once you get that, say it works out to a 5% per year or 2% or 10 or whatever you guys decide, um, you take that number and then you add whatever that year's inflation is. So if that current year's inflation was 3%, say the plan comes up and it's like, okay, 3% tax increase per year, just random numbers. It's not what it is. I just made that up. But say inflation is 3%, where well, you go three plus three, well, it's now 6%. And so you, you base it kind of year by year, that's how you could do it. But to Jordan's point, which I think is a very smart strategy, is you're taking your investments, you're getting returns on those, and that's offsetting inflation, which is a sophisticated and a very smart way uh, to do it. So I'll, I'll end at that. And, and McKenna, feel free to jump in. Thanks. Uh, you know, it is super interesting. I think uh, <clears throat> you lost me for a little bit. I came back. I think I found it. Uh, then you lost me again. But, you know, it's pretty interesting stuff. And, you know, I, I also like like Councillor Minions, I want to recognize previous councils and staff for really allowing the town of Comox to kind of be ahead of the curve. And I know like when Clive totally nerds out on this stuff and I, I always appreciate it as well. Um, my question might be more to Jordan. Jordan, do we have a it, when we inventory our assets, is it an automated system or do we have to manually calculate things like how? How is that um, inventory? Just, uh, it must be, a, there must be a methodology. Yeah, you know, it's, it's daily. It's getting into reporting on the assets every time you touch them, right? So if you're doing things properly and we're building out the proper system, and that's part of the IT infrastructure upgrades that we've been going through is to be able to have the type of servers and programs to be able to do this. But when you're getting into the absolute best practice, every time you touch a piece of infrastructure, you should be making notes on it. And what was replaced? What was the value of the replacement? Have you increased the value of the asset? Have you decreased the value of the asset? So it is really manually input data on every asset that we have in the town. And as we continue to build out the sophistication of the system, we should be able to get um, deeper and deeper into uh, the value of the different things. So, um, you know, one of the areas where we probably have the least I don't, want, I don't know if it's accurate or detailed information is when you get into buildings. I find buildings are the hardest things to keep track of because money and, and things go in and out of them all the time and they don't get tracked um, the best. But yes, it is, it is really manually inputting each repair that you make each time that you change something into the overall GIS system, which will then track and project this information out. And that's where I was saying one day we'll need to get Clive to open up the hood of this system so you can see what actually goes into it behind the scenes. And does Clive have a Civic or a Toyota? <laughs> Clive, you know, I, I, the best way to um, maybe describe it would be Clive's got the uh, Empire State Building, but built out of paper clips and, uh, <laughs> and rubber bands. It, it's amazing what he's able to do on Excel. It just blows my mind, to be honest. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, and okay. I'll, I'll jump in there quickly to uh, just to kind of build on, on Jordan's uh, thoughts there is the cool thing that Clive has done, which I think is unique, uh, is we're using the same inventory that reports out on your financials for this plan. And so it's one inventory. So I think what I've seen other communities make the mistake is they'll build kind of two inventories, one for financial reporting and one for asset management planning. The inventories go out of sync a bit. Uh, you definitely one day want to skate towards a more sophisticated GIS system, and, but that, I think, can be a later down the road investment. Uh, but what's cool with what Clive set up is every work order or work that's done on an asset is tied to that financial system, which is now tied to this plan. So it is, uh, as Jordan said, it's, it's the Empire State Board built with some paper clips and rubber bands. And it's really cool to see how he's been able to automate as, as much as he can, uh, tying it to work orders and exact work and using this inventory for both plans. Uh, that saved huge operational efficiencies. Uh, Clive can now click a button, export a new uh, inventory and the plan can be updated. Whereas other communities, it's, it's a lot more work. So he saved a lot of staff time uh, in that way, so. And, and one other, it, this is really exciting because it gets to the point where I, I can kind of talk to council and tie all the different things that are happening in the municipality. So last meeting, we had an on table item to put the application in for the development pr approvals grant within British Columbia. And part of what we want to do with that grant, if we're successful, and we've, we've went big, we asked for $500,000, the province isn't going to give it to us, but we'll see what we can get. 
because part of that is to get that type of programming to allow finance the building um, building inspection and planning department as well as the public works department to have the type of programming infrastructure so that they can all talk to each other which can only happen now because the IT investments that councils made over the past couple of years to ensure that data can travel between all of our different buildings at a sufficient and enough speed for this to take place so it's really, it really is exciting to see all of these disparate pieces starting to fall together and what it means for the capabilities for us to gather the information, to feed it to council so you guys can make the decisions you want to make on infrastructure levels in the community. 100% and, and thanks for tying that all, all together, Jordan. Um, and I guess just one last thing too, Pat, you were mentioning uh, reserve levels and what that means. I'm not gonna go into that too much now because it'll derail us. But just one seed I'll plant is one way to tie this all together. As Jordan said, it's a nice way to tie everything together is I would look at, you know, as you guys explore different scenarios, what I would consider is uh, you can kind of set reserve levels or it can help inform those levels based on the amount of assets that are past its life. So we're not going to get into this today. But for example, say you do decide to pick scenario four uh, that you allow 14% of your assets to go past their life. Well, that's an okay scenario, but that means there's a risk that about 14% of them could fail. Now, how do you protect that risk or that downside? Well, you could have a portion of that in a reserve. So maybe the policy or thought process behind council is like, yeah, let's allow 14% of our assets to go past their life, but let's have half of that, 7% of that in a reserve fund. So if they do actually fail, we'll be able to deploy the capital right away. And so this is how you can even tie reserve funding to these levels. And maybe you're like, hey, you know what? We want to keep our amount of assets past its life at 2%. Well, that's a lot lower risk level. So let's keep our reserve level at a little bit lower level. So that's a trade-off. We won't get into that today, but I just thought I'd bring it. I promised that I would tie it all together for you. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd share that quickly. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments for Corey or Jordan? You do? Oh, Councillor Grant, okay. He's looking right at me and saying, Who? I didn't see your light on, sorry. <laughs> I didn't have it on. So I guess my real question is, does anyone know Clive's last name? Like I asked him and I don't think he knew what it was. It's, it's, it's Freudlich. Freudlich, yeah, it's, it, depending on what country you're in. Anyway, I was looking at, you know, I, I'm just looking at, um, and maybe I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but if you looked at scenario four, at a $620,000 increase, when you do the math, that, that gets you near an 8% tax increase, which I assume is gonna be a one time, but my question might be to Jordan, and I can't remember when we did our budget, how much did we put into reserves this year, or would this be 620 over what we did this year? It, it's so hard to compare to what we did this year because we have a $9 million capital spend. So what you need to do is go through that $9 million capital spend and take out what would have been spent on capital, which would be included in that, you know, what if four, let's say 4 million for conversation. If we say we need to put $4 million aside or into our assets and we've got this $9 million spend, you have to take anything that's in that capital management plan and put that funds towards the, the 4 million. So it's, it's really hard to say um, unless you go through that deep uh, analysis. Okay, yeah, I guess maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because on top of that, like you've still got your staff that you have to pay and that's usually about a 2% increase too. So you start getting into these increases and you know, I, I guess I look and go, is there some way that you can sort of spread it out over a few years so you don't take a 8% hit right now, but you kind of do a, 4% three years in a row or something, you know, that, that kind of a scenario to get yourself where you want to go. Yeah. And that's the conversations we're going to be having with council. So, you know, and this goes back to why I, I want to, maybe this isn't the right word, but why I was so adamant that we need to try and deal with our operational increases right now, because this is going to be coming down the future. And so council, you've done a really um, good job by taking care of the operational increases that we need. And I think we're, we're over halfway there to getting um, the operational, the operational increases we need. And it does look like next year, you'll be able to take care of the operational side of the organization with a um, modest enough tax increase that council. Mike, I always say these Mike things, I, can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you what you're going to do, but let me just say from what I project happening, I think council is going to be able to next year, 
raise the taxes at a level where you'll be comfortable in order to cover off the operational increases that we have. You might need one more year to do that. So let's say within two years, we're completely funding the operational side of the organization. That's great. Then we need to take a look at what we need to fund for the capital side. I don't know what that number is because we're putting money into capital every year right now, but it's all mixed together. It's mixed together between capital spending that's part of asset management, capital spending that's not part of asset management, and then special projects. So that all needs to be separated out, but we got a couple of years to get there. So right now, I think the focus for me is still on making sure that we're funding the operational side of the organization. And as we spend the next year together talking about what you want your asset health scores to be, that picture will come much clearer. And next year in the budget process, as you go through it, we're going to start to see, oh, okay, all of this stuff is going to be part of asset management in the future. And this is how much money we're already putting aside. So then we can start to see what the difference is, plus or minus moving forward. Okay. Now, now I'm where Pat was. I got a little bit lost, there, but I think I came back at the end. So. Okay. That's good. So uh, to make a long story short, I think the first thing we need to do is ensure that we're taking care of the operational side of the organization. And we're, I think we're going to do that next year, maybe next year plus one. And then after that, we're going to take care of the capital side of the organization. And you'll have a much clearer picture of what that dollar amount is once we go through the next budget, which is going to start soon. Um, because we're going to move the timeline up. So it's not it's not as far in the future as you think it uh, may be. Yeah, and I'll just quickly jump in there to kind of build on what Jordan mentioned too, is uh, the number, I think someone mentioned maybe it wasn't as uh, crazy as you would have thought. Uh, that's a good thing. That means we've honed it in a bit. But just keep in mind, this is only accounting for asset replacements. So when you looked at that funding gap, it was under the assumption that all the capital that's kind of calculate, like brought in, not used on operations is invested into asset replacement only. Jordan alluded to that's being bundled together right now with special projects, level service increases and asset replacement. So you not only have to kind of, I think it's, you know, stepping stones, operations first, let's get that sorted as Jordan said. Step number two, let's talk about capital asset replacement, step number two. Step number three, which will kind of layer on top of that is what new projects or level of service increases do you guys want to do? Widening roads, building new parks, et cetera. So just a little note, uh, this is only assuming all that capital is being used on asset replacement, which is not the case today. Um, but anyways, I'll just end with that, so. Okay, thanks, anything else? Seeing none, Corey, thank you very much for that. Um, it was, it was uh, very informative. And, uh, and Jordan, thanks for your input as well. So uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll carry on. And uh, Corey, uh, have yourself a good evening. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate everyone's support, uh, council, staff, everyone uh, taking interest in this. It's an important uh, subject and appreciate the dialogue uh, today. Have a wonderful evening and we'll chat soon. Yeah, thanks, cheers. Okay, so uh, we'll move on to the strategic priorities report from uh, May the 12th. Move receipt. And secondary. Second. Sorry. Okay, any questions or comments on that? Oh, sorry, Councillor Swift, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Jordan, I know uh, that you've been looking for some help in engineering and planning, and I was just wondering if you'd had any progress with that. Yeah, you know what, I think we may have found um, the help we need in both engineering and planning um, too, too, a little too soon to say we have it for sure, but the discussions are far enough that um, I would be more surprised if we don't have the resources that we need than I would be. I'd be more surprised if those resources don't pan out. So I, I'm very optimistic and hopefully we'll have that all sorted out by the end of next week. Good, thanks. Any other Questions or comments on the strategic uh, report? All right, seeing none, I think that uh, takes us to the end of this. So motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 